Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to today's scrutiny meeting. Um, that first item is apologies for absence. I haven't received any apologies. Is anybody else? Nope. Okay. Um, item number two, urgent business. Um, I've got one item of urgent business. Um, as the panel members are aware, um, I'm still suffering the after effects of a recent bout of COVID, um, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to chair the entirety of the meeting. Um, I'd therefore like to nominate Miranda Williams to be the vice chair of the panel in the event I can't continue. Uh, the members of the panel happy to approve this? Yeah. yeah, great, thank you. Hopefully I will be able to, but just in case, I've got a feeling the meeting might go on quite a while. Um, item three, declarations of interest. So can the panel agree to note the list of council appointed councillors memberships on the outside bodies, joint committees and school governing bodies? And does any member wish to declare a personal or financial interest relating to these agenda items? Uh, Chair, I have one. Um, founder and convener of the Plumstead Rail User Group. Chair, do we have to declare our interests if we are incredibly frustrated southeastern commuters, or should we take that as red? I think we're fine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Fine. So item four are the minutes from the 4th of July scrutiny panel. Um, I had one addition just under item four noting before the resolution that none of the members of the panel were members at the time of that previous meeting. Um, does anyone have anything else? No? Nope. Okay. So we move on to item five, uh, which is the meet of today's meeting, our annual transport scrutiny meeting. So for this meeting, I'm pleased to represent, uh, welcome representatives from TFL and South Eastern. Um, I'd like to thank them for coming this evening. And if South Eastern, would you like to come forward first and introduce yourselves? So good evening, um, I'm Alex Hellier. I actually work for Network Rail and I'm Head of Strategic Planning for uh, Kent and Sussex areas of the southern region. Good evening, I'm Scott Brightwell. I'm the Operations and Safety Director for South Eastern. And good evening, my name's Steve White. I'm the Managing Director of South Eastern Trains. Thank you. Would you mind taking your name tags and putting them in front of you? That would be really helpful. Um, so there's a lot to cover in this meeting, so I just want a quick note on how I'm going to run it. Um, South Eastern are going to deliver their presentation first. I'll then take questions from the panel. Uh, we're going to start with general questions regarding December's timetable cuts, um, for example, on consultation, rationale, mitigations, etc. I'm then going to take questions from the panel line by line for the three lines in Greenwich. So Woolwich and Greenwich, Bethlehem Heath and the Sidcup line, and then we'll follow with non-timetable related questions for South Eastern. I'm then going to invite questions from any other councillor to the extent the question hasn't already been asked. And I will then take questions from local amenity groups and any members of the public who wish to ask a question. Um, yeah, is there? Sorry. Sorry, is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, would you like me to go through that again, or are you happy? I'll start again. Okay, so um, South Eastern is going to deliver a presentation. I'm then going to take questions from the panel, and we're going to start with general questions regarding uh, the December timetable changes. Um, I'm then going to take questions from the panel line by line, so Woolwich and Greenwich, Bexley Heath and Sidcup, followed by any non-timetable related questions for South Eastern. I'll then invite questions from any other councillor present to represent the views of their residents. I'll then take questions from any local amenity groups, for example, residents associations, rail users groups, etc. And I'll then take questions from members of the public. I'd ask that people don't repeat questions um, that have already been asked. You can see it's going to be quite a busy meeting and ask that your contributions are also limited to two minutes for non-panel members. We're then going to move on to TFL, which will take a similar format. Um, we've got a lot to cover, so are you ready to begin your presentation? Yes, so um, good evening, Chair and Committee. Um, so 
Alex Ellis. So from a uh, Network Rail perspective, I, I'm the warm-up act, I think, for, um, for the main events. So I, but I did want to highlight that from a long-term perspective, um, we are, are looking at the future rail needs of South London. We see rail is vital to the economy of South London, where there's limited access to the underground network. Um, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, we've suffered uh, a large uh, drop in passengers during the pandemic, as well as revenue, um, and the network has not yet recovered. We have recently uh, published our long-term strategy for South London, which looks at various service options over the next 30 years. In the medium term, we do expect growth will return and crowding will return on some lines. There is the opportunity will be to mitigate this through new start, uh, metro style rolling stock, lengthening trains, and then increasing frequencies. I think there is a shared vision with all of us for enhanced capacity, reliability, which comes with a simpler timetable, and connectivity. But we do have a line of sight to 2050. Uh, the service recovery post-COVID must uh, react to the evolving market, as we now see. The Elizabeth Line is providing vital new capacity. Uh, it has a very uh, swift journey from central London to Will um, down to Woolwich. Housing and jobs growth will drive an increase in rail patronage. And we know particularly there's large housing growth planned in Greenwich, and rail can be a facilitator uh, to unlock development around the, around the borough. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Steve White. I'm the Managing Director of South Eastern Trains. I joined a year ago. I've been in the rail industry for 39 years. I've worked in the public sector at British Rail. I ran the subsurface lines on London Underground. I've got experience of suburban rail at Silverlink Trains and, and uh, GTR. And I've got experience of running high-speed trains at Eurostar. So um, a long, a long uh, life in the railway. Um, the other thing I want to say before we start is I've not bought my phone a friend. You know, there are 1,600 trains in our timetable. You might have some very specific trains at certain hours of the day, certain uh, stations, certain, certain lines of route. If we do not know the answer between myself and my operations director, we will take that away and we will revert to you. So what we'd like to do this afternoon is share the context of the changes we've made. Why do we wake up? And, and make these changes? What's the principles behind them? What are we trying to achieve? And what feedback are we seeking uh, from the council? So if I can ask my glamorous assistant to turn to the first slide. You know, whether it's what's happening in government or what's happening in society in general, I don't think I've ever seen a time in 39 years looking quite like this one. Travel habits appear to have changed, and they may have changed fundamentally and irreversibly. I don't know how many people in this chamber tonight will travel to work five days this week, but if you do, you are in a minority. The latest report is that people are traveling to the office typically less than two days a week, and we've all got used to the benefits of hybrid working. So our peak travel demand remains incredibly low, and our off-peak has recovered, but is still obviously in absolute terms much less than that in the peak. Um, you can look at it in other ways as well. If you look at season ticket holders, we have got one-third of the number of season ticket holders that we had before the COVID um, pandemic. And yesterday, there were about 70% of the pre-COVID demand traveling on our railway. That's as good as it gets. On Monday, that figure was 58%. The Elizabeth line is a game changer. I was at Abbey Wood last Friday morning. Uh, there is a significant abstraction of people getting off southeastern trains and walking across the overbridge and getting onto the Elizabeth line, and I don't blame them for that. That's how I'm getting home this evening. Um, we've also recognized that first-class travel is um, f uh, few and far between. So on our mainline services, we have 28 annual season ticket holders in the whole of Kent and East Sussex, 28. That's fallen by well over 90% since pre-COVID. So we are going to withdraw all first-class capability from our rolling stock 
uh, from the 11th of December, and those tickets will no longer be on sale. Uh, we are trying to build a railway for the many, and that means that every seat will be available for every customer. The other thing that I'm sure you're aware of is that um, Southeastern Trains is now in the public sector and has been for more than a year. We're an arm's length uh, government body uh, as part of the Department for Transport. We're technically a not-for-dividend company, so we make an operating margin of 1%, but that belongs to, our, to, to the Department for Transport and the Treasury. We do not have private sector shareholders. We do not have a profit motive, and it currently costs £6.2 million per, pounds per week, or approximately a million pounds a day, to operate southeastern services. If you win the lottery on Saturday and you've got £6 million you'd like to invest, I'd give you complete charge of our railway for seven days. But at the end of that time, the railway reverts to effectively the state. So that's the context. It's a very changed demand and a railway in the public sector. If you turn to the next slide, let's kind of show you that on a graph. The graph on the right-hand side might be hard to see from the back, but that is the ORR's data as to how many journeys are being made on each train operator in the country between April and June of this year. So this is their most recent data published just a few days ago. At the um, top of the chart, there's some um, great recovery, particularly on companies like London Northeastern Railway, where cheap, cheaper tickets and leisure fares have led to a bounce back in travel. But if you look lower down, Southeastern is third from bottom in the recovery. And next to Southwest Trains and GTR and C2C, the recovery of all of those companies is about between 65 and 68% of pre-pandemic levels. So there are huge holes in our railway where customers used to be. If you look at the graph on the left-hand side, that shows you what a busiest day of the week looks like. That's a Thursday. The blue vertical lines are how many people are traveling each hour in 2019. That's the pre-COVID position. And the dark line is the number of people traveling at the moment each hour. And you can see that in the off-peak between about 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., we're nearly back to pre-pandemic levels, but it's still a relatively small volume of people, and there is a seat for everyone on our trains in the off-peak. In the peak, you'll see a huge gap, particularly in the morning peak. You know, there are just far fewer people wanting to get to the office every day of the week by, six, by 10 o'clock in the morning. And the same is true, but to a slightly lesser extent, in the evening peak. And if you looked at those graphs on a Monday or a Friday, the gap would be even starker. If you turn to the next slide, please. So we're wrestling with a situation which we haven't, frankly, seen before. Customers have not come back in the volumes that we want them to. We're advertising promotions to the coast. Uh, we're appealing to commuters. We've done flexi leisure seasons. But the bottom line is uh, passenger numbers are much lower than they were pre-COVID, particularly in the peaks. So we're looking to make an opportunity to address what every customer satisfaction survey tells us is the greatest priority of customers, which is the punctuality and reliability of our train service. And everyone in this room, if you travel regularly on our services, will at times have been delayed through sheer congestion. Um, and I've been frankly shocked at the low level of absolute punctuality on this railway. Our ambition is to run trains on time, that means they arrive at their destination within 59 seconds of plan at each station stop, and we are a very long way from achieving that. The changes that um, we have made 
we've made them quickly, and I'll come on to a moment to explain why, but we are still listening, and we do want to take all your feedback on board. The December 22 timetable is our next timetable. It is not our end state timetable. It is not our final timetable. What we're trying to do is lay foundations for growth in the future, foundations based on a much simpler, a fundamentally, structurally much simpler timetable, one that's easier to scale up in the future, one which will always be more punctual and more reliable, and one which will flourish if I can add new air-conditioned rolling stock uh, to a simpler uh, and better railway. If you turn to the next slide, please. I understand and I recognize the criticism about the lack of consultation. I really do. Um, we don't make these changes lightly. You know, we have literally removed first-class tickets from our mainline product without any consultation. We are seeking to engage and explain and to listen, but we have not done any consultation. And I apologize for that, and I acknowledge that. I have a formal derogation, a written formal derogation, from the Department for Transport to not consult on this. And the reason why is because we, re, we, we are literally living in a very agile world. We have changed our timetable 15 times since March 2020. In a normal cycle, we should have changed it no more than five times. So we are working at a pace that I've never seen in 39 years. We developed this timetable some months ago in the early part of this year, and to be candid, doing nothing didn't feel like an option because we expect customers to come back and we want to solve some of the problems we see every day. And we also believed it would have been disingenuous to come to you in April or May with uh, our proposals beyond the point which we could then change our timetable and do something different. So we are listening now, but I do acknowledge the fact that we did not formally consult on these changes. And that was something that was discussed at very senior levels. It's not a, a unilateral decision that Southeastern has taken. We are living in a world of pace and change and agility, but I do acknowledge that you would normally expect pre-COVID changes of this nature to have been subject to consultation. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, if we turn to the next slide. I'm just going to ask Scott to walk you through what our customers' priorities normally are and how we've set about achieving those, but to be honest about some of the trade-offs that that now entails. Thank you. Good evening. Um, just to give a bit of background to myself on the operations. Just to give, is that any better? Is that any better? Is that Thank you. Um, just to give a bit of background on myself, I'm the operations director for Southeastern. I've got around 32 years of experience dealing with railway operations, and uh, part of my portfolio in Southeastern includes the train planning teams that will have looked at the, at the building blocks for this December timetable. So. Um, I'd like to start by going through passenger priorities. Um, every bit of research, the slide that you can see there is from a recent uh, the transport focus report, which actually asked the question around what drives satisfaction for rail passengers. And by far and away, um, the, the standout, standout element is around the punctuality and reliability. This is not new. This is, you know, there's been previous research reports, but this one was done in 2021, so has some cognizance of pandemic impacts. What you will see is the, the dot on the top right-hand quadrant. Effectively on this, the further right you are, the more important it is to customers, and the further up you are, the higher influence it will have on your perception and satisfaction levels. So what you can see on there is other elements such as um, tickets, value for money, availability of staff and information provision, all very important items as part of a customer service, do not altogether add up as, as, well, as severely as the impact of a reliable and punctual train service. 
our timetable is our promise to customers, it's what people build their lives around, and actually that drives passenger satisfaction. That's an important piece of context um, that I wanted to provide. So in a second, I'm going to show a, a short video that demonstrates the challenge around delivering punctuality and reliability in this area. So the first, part of this that you, the first part of this that you're going to see is a train. This is at a higher speed, um, but not as, as great a speed as the section you'll see in a, in a sec. You can see a train crossing over there in front of another train. This is on the route from London Bridge, and you can see a train having to come to a stand and then cross over a set of tracks. That is a driver's eye view of what takes place, sped up uh, a bit, on this piece, we've sped it up by 180 times. This is a junction in the Lewisham area, and every time you can see these trains crisscrossing, every slight pause you see is a train pausing for at least three minutes because of the amount of time that we've sped that up. And I figured that an image would actually demonstrate the complexity of what we have to try and deliver more than words. So... That becomes absolutely key in operating our network. That junction at Lewisham effectively is like the epicenter of our network. As soon as there is disruption in the Lewisham area with those crossing moves, it becomes a real challenge in terms of delivering the service. Delays will ripple onto other routes, so you end up with network-wide impact as a result of those crossover moves that are happening on that video. What we have um, in the December timetable, we simplify the operation. So there are two routes here that I would call out. So firstly, the Hayes Line trains will go into Cannon Street, but from December, they'll run straight through to Charing Cross. Now that is the far left line if you're looking at the stations and effectively goes from, if you're looking on a clock face, from six o'clock in the evening to nine o'clock at night. What that train will no longer do is cross over the busy junction at Lewisham and go up towards 10, 11 o'clock. That is just the crossing moves that, I had, uh, that were visualised in the previous video. In a similar fashion, the Woolwich Line services would go to Cannon Street, so they wouldn't go to um, and cross over, and that will simplify that bottleneck um, in the Lewisham area. Now, that is important for two, two factors. One is that it means trains will be more reliable and punctual, which we've demonstrated how busy that junction is. That was an hour's train. We, we base uh, an hour's clip. We generally have 28 trains operating across that junction currently, of which 24 cross in front of each other. That is very, very complicated, and as soon as very small delays happen, it has a wide-ranging ripple effect across the whole network, impacting hundreds of thousands of customers. The second part to, um, that this is very important for is a simpler network is also one that we can grow as passenger demand comes back. So frequency of service is obviously key, but when I come to passenger numbers in a second, specifically for the free lines, the, the ability to, uh, the scalability of this timetable, where it is much simpler, means that in the future we can add services to it without redesigning the whole timetable again, because passenger demand isn't coming back in exactly the same way on every single route across the network. So it's important we have a flexible base timetable that we can adapt as people return. Typically from December, we have removed two-thirds of the crossing moves, so we have simplified that junction significantly, which will reduce the knock-on impact of delays and cancellations and trains running fast and skipping stations, which is very, very unpopular. Our modelling predicts um, circa a 12% reduction in cancellations across our network and over 300,000 more on-time station calls being made every year. A simpler network will operate, frankly, better and more reliably so that people can depend on it more. So this timetable, as I said, it will be better, it will be simpler, it will be more punctual. 
it will reduce the congestion at key junctions. The image on the top right is effectively a, you know, a, a diagram to say this is how complex it is before and how we've made it as a result of the changes. However, we cannot, um, you know, we do recognise that some routes will now be operating into a single London termini. Now, that is a change for customers. However, to deliver this in the London area, it is not unusual to operate into a single termini for many, many operators in London. And it is also quite usual for interchange to happen within London. And on TfL, the average of interchange is 1.4 times per journey. So this is saying, you know, we understand that this timetable will involve new interchanges for some customers that do not exist today. But we cannot meet the number one customer priority of having a reliable and punctual service or, in fact, a timetable that can be scalable as passengers return without complete rewrites, which take months to do and, when we do them very, very quickly, are not very robust. They do not deliver a reliable timetable. I'm just going to talk now a bit about demand. Steve talked about the seismic change and, and showed the, the peak services and what the pre-COVID demand was like. I've broken that down um, to uh, more relevant to the routes of the Bexley Heath line, the Sidcup line and the Woolwich line. As you can see in the table um, on the Bexley Heath line, up to September in 2019, there were almost 28 million journeys on southeastern services. Up to September this year, it was 16.5 million. So it's a 40% reduction. There's a similar but slightly more stark reduction on the Sidcup line and a similar level of just 40.6% of on the Woolwich line. So 20.5 million people, passenger journeys down to 12.2 million. They are very, very significant reductions. You know, the popularity of the Elizabeth line has reduced demand on southeastern services. Four out of every five customers, 81% travelling from Abbey Wood, do not travel to London terminals. We're seeing huge interchange for the Elizabeth line at Abbey Wood. So there has been a, you know, a very, very significant change, which is fantastic, the frequency, the journey opportunities that it's giving customers but people are traveling very differently because of the pandemic and because of the fantastic Elizabeth line. Um, just to talk about space and what is with those reductions, our proposed, uh, our timetable for, Decem for December, I've broken down some of the journeys by peak, off peak and weekends just to demonstrate the level of space that will exist in this timetable. Um, and it comes back to two key things. Have we got space for customers to return in the peak? And can we continue to grow discretionary level off-peak uh, travel? We want to grow our railway. We want customers to come back, and we need to ensure that there's space for that to happen. So as an example, in the morning peak to London, in December 19, the customer demand was 15,000 uh, of 15,500 um, people. That's the space that existed. And the current demand is 7.2 thousand. In December, there's 16,000, there's space for 16,000 people. Now, some of that has been bought on. We've got um, 707 trains on some of those uh, routes have got increased capacity. And as you can see, there's space in the morning peak for almost 9,000 additional people with the plan that comes in on December the 11th. Turning to weekday off-peak, you can see that the customers off-peak uh, at 100% of demand like pre-COVID was 23,000 or 23,500. And there's a huge amount of space, over 100 or 115,000 plus um, capacity on those trains. So there's huge opportunity for leisure and off-peak travel. Um, Evening peak is a similar position to the morning peak, um, slightly lower numbers in the evenings. That mirrors what we expect from passenger travel habits. It was similar to prior to COVID. The, some people travel home in a different way in the evenings than they do in the mornings, and that is reflected by the, the demand pre-COVID in the evening peak. 
and you can see our current demand is uh, is lower than the AM morning peak demand as we sit here today. Those statistics are taken by a combination of um, load weight. So some of our trains weigh the amount of people on and off trains. And we also supplement that with manual passenger counts that have been taking place within the last, well, they're still ongoing on some routes, but we prioritised these routes to make sure we had the latest information. So it's data-driven in terms of load way off of trains combined with manual counts that are done across all of the stations um, over a couple of month period that's taking place as we sit here today. Turning to weekends, again, you can see it's a similar pattern that we have, you know, 34,000 people travelling on a Saturday. Um, there is space for 160,000 people, so plenty of opportunity for growth at uh, the weekends. And I won't call out the numbers again, but you can see from the table that there is a similar opportunity for growth at weekends. Obviously, recognising that at weekends there are often engineering books that change these uh, on a weekend by weekend basis re um, as we have to maintain the network and, and do repairs and maintenance at weekends. By far and away, the biggest challenge of this timetable is changing at London Bridge. That new interchange that I described in the earlier slides, we recognise that. Our draft equality impact assessment takes account of this. We are working through the testing that needs to take place of, um, in advance of the timetable change date. Um, there are several elements to aid accessibility a transfer, for example. We have additional mobile assistance staff that will be in place from early December specifically to deal with the interchange that will take place and assist people with mobile assistance, whatever their needs may be. There is a lift engineer in situation for the busiest times of the day, and outside of these hours, there's a 45-minute response time for, the, you know, for this essential service that we totally understand is absolutely key in making that interchange as smooth as possible. The station is safe, it's well lit, it's weatherproof, you know, we've got, um, it's secure, there are, you know, um, it's free Wi-Fi, there's lots and lots of staff at all times of day. It's a one billion redevelopment that has provided step-free access to all platforms and easier connections to many, many other rail services on the tube. The typical transfer time is eight to ten minutes. Um, it is slightly different in certain times of day, but if you look at the busiest times, between 7 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning, there are 59 departures from London Bridge to Charing Cross and 46 from London Bridge to Cannon Street for transferring customers. So the other trains that come in from other locations provide a, a frequent and reliable interchange. In the other direction, coming out of London, between 1600 and uh, 1900, there will be 62 departures from Charing Cross to London Bridge and 47 from Cannon Street to London Bridge. So in terms of that interchange, there is a frequent and reliable service. There is a, you know, a huge new station that's had massive investment specifically designed you know, to ensure that there is good connectivity and it can deal with large volumes of passengers. You know, we have seen that in special events during, for example, the, the morning of the Queen or the Jubilee weekend. The station has dealt with huge volumes of people um, interchanging to other modes. So we have got experience of operating this during special events and it's, a, you know, it's got good infrastructure to make this a reliable, safe and dependable interchange for customers going forward. So um, I'm now going to hand over back to Steve White, who's going to cover things around um, some other news and summarise before we open up for questions. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Scott. We've got two more slides, and then we're very happy to take your questions. London Bridge is key. We do understand we are asking some people to change trains at London Bridge. During the morning period, when people joined that queue for the lying in state, London Bridge became a, a, a very critical drop-off point to join the end of the queue. We dealt with record numbers of um, accessible travellers, 
and we are committed to doing this change well and London Bridge is a good station to do it at. Uh, so if you turn to the next slide, I just wanted to share a few other things. You know, we are seeking to build a better railway on a long-term basis. That means we want to give customers compensation where they're entitled to it. So earlier this year, uh, we've introduced one-click delay repay. If you register with us on a smart card, you tell us the normal journey you make. If that journey is delayed, we will ask you if you were on that train and if you had a ticket and if you click yes, the money will come straight to you. It's, it's the fastest way of getting passenger compensation on UK rail. If you're also delayed on our railway and want to donate your money to charity, there was a fatality at Bromley South earlier this week. You can donate delay repay money to the likes of the Samaritans and the Railway Children and Great Ormond Street. We're committed to more access for all. We've recently opened uh, access for all scheme at Chatham. Uh, we are doing the design work now for your stations at Plumstead and Bexley. And in uh, control period seven, we've put forward Kidbrook, Erith, Sidcup and Crayford as stations that should benefit from access for all funding. On Sunday morning, I was at London Bridge Station with the London Ambulance Service. We now have a defibrillator on every station on Southeastern. That's 164 stations. The smallest station with the smallest footfall has a defibrillator, and that defibrillator is available for the community, not only for railway customers. There are 17 defibrillators at London Bridge and a permanent paramedic on duty. We've also um, completed the installation with colleagues at Network Rail of over 25 kilometers of tactile paving. So every platform on every station on the Southeastern Network now has tactile paving. We are concerned at the level of antisocial uh, behavior on our railway. So I've secured some additional funding from the Department for Transport and starting this month through the autumn and through the winter at 19 stations where the highest levels of antisocial behaviour are to be found and that includes Woolwich Arsenal and Lewisham and Dartford. There will be security staff every evening from 2pm till 10pm seven days a week to try and curb antisocial behaviour and make our railway accessible for all. We have transferred over 18 Class 707 modern trains to our network. There are 12 more with our name on them that we will be transferring over from South Western Railways uh, next year. And they, they are good news for customers. They are air conditioned, they are higher capacity, and they perform much uh, more reliably than our th networkers that recently celebrated their 30th anniversary. And finally, our Class 376 fleet. Um, I'm embarrassed at the state of that fleet. It needs a renovation internally. It needs to have an ambience suitable for customers. And we have agreed with the owners of that train a multi-million pound refurbishment package, which will commence next year and uh, ensure that the interior of those trains is appropriate for our customers traveling on the southeastern metro uh, network. So if I turn to my final slide, we've shared a lot of information today, but I really I wanted to summarize. Our long-term ambition, aligned to Network Rail's strategic plan, is that the southeast metro becomes a punctual turn-up-and-go railway which is integrated with other public transport, whether that's with the DLR at Lewisham, whether that's with um, London Underground at uh, the likes of London Bridge, whether that's with the Crossrail line at uh, the likes of Abbey Wood. But we, we want to create a punctual turn up and go service integrated with buses and other public transport. To do that, we need to simplify our timetable so it's scalable in the future and so that it uh, is punctual. And we need some new trains 
to be candid, we need some new rolling stock. The timetable you will see on the 11th of December is intended to match the demand for customers that we have today. Everybody in the off-peak should get a seat and there's room for significantly more people to travel in the peak. You know, we travelled here this evening, the five of us got a seat, a seat together and were surrounded by other empty seats at half past five on a Thursday, which is the busiest day of the week. We will make changes, or these changes will improve our punctuality and our reliability. It's not a it's not a guarantee because there could be a trespasser on the railway. A train could fail. Like last night at Lewisham, a passenger could be taken ill. It won't remove all sources of delay, but it will dramatically reduce delays associated with congestion and the ripple effect where a problem on the Hayes line bounces into a problem in the Sidcup line and a problem on the Greenwich line causes a problem on the Bexley Heath line. At the moment, you know, when the metro service goes wrong, it quickly goes wrong everywhere. This is not our end state. It's the timetable of now, and we are listening to the feedback. We should give you a more punctual service with these changes, but we do accept that some journeys you can make today will not be possible in the future without tra changing trains, and we do acknowledge that trade-off and that impact on our customers. So we are listening on our website. There's a place to, to send all your feedback to. We are doing meet the manager sessions out at stations listening. We do online meet the manager sessions and we welcome all correspondence with regards to these changes. So we can reflect on your nuanced feedback as we design our future timetables. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, that was really helpful to understand some of the rationale. Um, you admitted you've done no consultation, so I'd like to do a tiny bit of consultation here. How many people here are happy to sacrifice one of their London termini for more reliability or punctuality? <laughs> Sorry. How many people... Okay. Um, so Steve White was saying that the, one of the reasons, the rationale for these changes is to improve reliability and punctuality. But for that, a lot of us are going to have to sacrifice some of the journeys that we make, so some of the end points. So I'm asking how many people are happy to make that trade-off? How many people are happy to sacrifice the London, <laughs> the London Termini for more reliability and punctuality? What worries me about... The, the rationale you've given is, I can understand punctuality and reliability are incredibly important, but you haven't asked if people would prefer that to having Charing Cross taken away from them. And that is... <laughs> the, the second piece of consultation I'd like to ask is you mentioned the Elizabeth line and how wonderful that is. And it, it, it looks great. I haven't been able to take the Elizabeth line yet because I live uh, down um, near, I told you, that's where I live, near Avery Hill. Thank you. <laughs> I told you my brain's not working quite well with uh, COVID at the moment. Recovering from COVID, not actual COVID. Um, so how many people here have easy access to the Elizabeth line because it's great for people in Abbey Wood, it's great for people in Woolwich, but how many people here have easy access to the Elizabeth line? And that's the thing. So you, you, you can already see from the room that there's a couple of really big gaps here in, in what you've presented to us, and, and that concerns me. And it concerns me because you say that you're here, that this isn't the end state, that you're listening to feedback, but you've also said the core rationale for what you're doing is to simplify 
the network and that you can add capacity onto that simplified network, that suggests to me there's no, there's no ability for you or will, there's an ability, there's no will for you to re-establish some of these termini. Can I come back on that? So, as I said before, we will listen to all this feedback. In the peak, we normally have 24 trains an hour crossing over each other at that junction. Do I think we need to go back to 24 trains an hour? Do I think that would give you a net positive improvement? Do I think the pre-COVID timetable is the right one? No, I don't. But what we've given you in December is the next iteration in a journey. And it may well be that if you, if you can um, articulate the times of the day, the days of the week, the, ch the, the principal gaps in our service based on your needs, we will reflect on that and we will try and solve the problems that we can solve. So I'm not going to give you, I, uh, there's a spectrum here, I'm not going to say that we won't make any changes in the future, that would be inappropriate to do. We are listening, but I'm also saying that the, that the pre-COVID timetable, with all its um, flaws, is not the end state either. But we are listening, Chair, and there may be some, um, some movement that we can make. And we, we need to, that's why we need granular and detailed feedback. You know, when I was at, when I was at um, Abbey Wood, for example, last um, Friday morning, I watched the buses come in from Sidcup and Bexley, and I understand there's connectivity, you know, at, to Abbey Wood from those locations, and the buses were busy, and so was the interchange. So we're, everyone is learning how to use the likes of the Elizabeth Line, and local public transport also needs to complement local rail transport. But, we, but this is a moving position. The number of people traveling is changing. The days of the week and the times of the day they're traveling is changing. And we are open-minded to seeing what we may be able to fix. But, we're, but I'm not going to promise you it will go back to how it was pre-COVID. But with respect, you say you want detailed feedback and the best way to do that would have been to have a consultation. Have a consultation and make the changes in May when your next iteration was. Yeah, no. I, I understood that. And I think I've said to you previously, doing nothing we didn't think was an outcome. You know, we're not here to manage the status quo. The simplest and easiest thing would be to do nothing. But if our railway grows on the timetable that we are operating today, it will break and it will break quickly. The timetable we have given you has capacity exactly where we need it in, uh, in December and is scalable for the future. So doing nothing wasn't an option. Scott, is there anything you want to add on that? I think on some of the... People were returning to the railway in different ways at different times of day. If we continued on with the existing timetable, today's timetable, there were actually some areas and some times of day where the capacity that the timetable delivers today would not have been enough. So some areas like um, the Beckenham Junction route into London, there were becoming the growth, we could actually deal with around 70% of pre-COVID levels and expecting that to grow to 80% would have meant that some services at some times of day on some lines of route would be broken. So doing nothing wasn't really an option. I'm not talking about every line on the, the Woolwich, the Bexley Heath or the Sidcup line, but there were other areas. So Beckenham Junction to Blackfriars, for example, had no train service since the, since the COVID timetables in March 2020. As part of that, there is a sort of duplication of operation with GTR services, and GTR were picking up those services, but their services were becoming too busy. So we've had to, re, to put some services back in there. So that's just one example of a line of route where people travelled differently, demand came back in that area faster than other areas, and actually sticking with the existing timetable wasn't a viable option. It would, it would basically, the capacity would not be in the right places for how people were travelling. 
Sorry, are you saying the demand was so big that you've taken those lines off because it couldn't cope with even more demand? No, no, sorry. Sorry, okay. Chair. <laughs> sorry. It's, there was... No. no. Some lines were getting so busy at some times a day, not all day, that we needed to change today's plan. It would not have coped with the number of people that were travelling on some routes. So the timetable we have today, sticking, if you like, was not an option because it was not sustainable, it wouldn't deal with future growth. Whereas the change that we've put in gives us the ability to do two things, create the space for how people are travelling now and also have room for future growth. Let me give you a different example. You saw that video. You saw trains crossing over each other back and forth 24 times every hour. So ask yourself if you wanted to slot one more train in there. It's not possible, there's no space. The capacity of that junction determines the capacity of the entire network. You know, it's a flat junction. It hasn't got a dive under or a, a flyover. So if we take the current timetable and we want to amend it, we have to rewrite the whole thing because all 24 trains are crisscrossing over each other. So we've got a brand new plan now, and I accept it's a very different plan, but we've now got a brand new plan. It's a very simple plan, and it's a plan that we can, we can, we can ad ad adapt uh, in the future. So if you give us your feedback, we will reflect on that. Okay. Um, I think we're going around in circles a bit with it. But I, I, do, I do feel like the timetable is very much giving you what you need and not really thinking about what passengers need. But, yeah. but move, moving, moving but, back but to that, make... that assumes that what I need doesn't include a punctuality. So I do accept that we didn't consult on this, but every, I get letters of complaints about punctuality and we get, and we know with every survey that's been done either within Southeastern or independently with Transport Focus, that service disruption and punctuality are always top of the list. But you're not comparing that with taking away services. That, that's, the, that's the thing. If people had an either or. I'd rather sit on a train for three weeks in Lewisham than take 10 minutes changing at London Bridge. Exactly. But, but anyway, moving on, going back to the decision um, to make these, t these timetable changes. Um, you mentioned that you're the operator of last resort. You effectively run the franchise on behalf of the government in an arm's length deal. How much influence would you say the government has on the operation of Southeast Trains? Do you have regular meetings with ministers and officers in the Department for Transport? I think it's fair to say that all train operators have regular meetings with the Department of Transport. So we meet them weekly and we meet them periodically on a formal basis. I've not seen the Rail Minister since 8.45 this morning and I won't see him again until next Wednesday. So, there, so, but to be clear, this is, we wouldn't do this if we didn't believe that in the long-term interests it would give you a more punctual and a bigger and a better railway. This railway needs, this, this railway need. It, it's highly, un, I accept that you are losing a choice of termini. It is highly unusual. If you, if you travel on C2C, you only go to Fenchurch Street. If you travel on Greater Anglia, you only go to Liverpool Street. If you travel on West Midland Trains, you only go to Euston. If you travel on Great Western, you only go to Paddington. If you travel on South Western Trains, you only go to Waterloo. It is unusual for services to be provided to multiple destinations. And it is quite normal. We, we fact check this with TfL. It is quite normal for people traveling within the M25 area, within, and on TfL, to travel 1.4 times on every journey they make. And I do acknowledge, if you currently do not have to travel, there is a downside to that. I do absolutely accept that. And as I say, if we understand where those pinch point, the greatest pinch points are, we will reflect on that. Okay, so back to my question. You meet with ministers regularly, um, and you've helpfully taken us through the changes made 
being made to the service within Greenwich. But I've had a look at other timetabling changes you've made across your network, um, and not every area is facing cuts. So areas in Kent have actually had an increase in services, um, including Maidstone East, which is a station sitting in the Conservative constituency of Maidstone and the Weald, which is going to have an at new hourly service to Charing Cross, and that's going to benefit commuters from the Conservative constituency of Seven Oaks. So just so that we're all clear in this room, because this is... Um, a Labour borough, and there are three Labour constituencies here. Is it the case that all the winners from the new timetable are Conservative areas and all the losers are Labour seats? No, it isn't. And, and, and to be absolutely clear, we would never design a timetable to that effect. The Maidstone East service uh, via London Bridge to Charing Cross is a long-standing commitment from the £7 billion Thameslink programme. It should have been a direct service from London Bridge, sorry, from Maidstone East through the core. If you look on Thameslink trains, there are even maps that show it. So this is a long-standing obligation to people when, the, after the consultation, when the Thameslink programme was created, that there would be services. We have not traded one for another. The rolling stock that goes to Maidstone East will be Class 377 Electrostar trains. That doesn't appear on any lines in this borough. You know, we, we serve the many, not the few. We are not prejudiced in our outcome. We are trying to build a railway in all respects. So to, the people of uh, Paddock Wood are not happy because we've, guess what, we've simplified the junction. We have trains that come down from Maidstone West no longer stop at Tunbridge. They only stop at Paddock Wood, except the school trains in the morning and the beginning and the end of the day. Why? So we've simplified Tunbridge as a junction in the same way we've simplified Lewisham as a junction. So please believe me when we say we've looked across the whole of southeastern We'll be running approximately 1,600 trains a day. We will be delivering an hourly service from Maidstone East via London Bridge and into Charing Cross, but we've not done that at the expense of our metro uh, services. You know, the only new trains that have come on our network have been the Class 707s. The only new trains I want to buy are for the metro, but, and the least punctual part of our railway is your part of our railway. But this isn't a class war, and it isn't red-blue. In fact, I'm not sure there's any blue anymore. Can I say that? Um, so, <laughs> believe me, we want to get this right. We want to get this. This is not being recorded, is it? We want to get this right for everybody. Honestly, we want to get this right for everybody. Um, to clarify, it is being recorded. It's a public I, meeting. I, I know. It's a candid, off-the-record, unattributable, and not, and, um, you know, it's a passing comment, but I don't mean it. Okay, um, can you just, just clarify when the decision was made to change the timetable and how that decision was communicated to the public? So um, I'm going to start to walk through the timetables. It, it takes several months to design a timetable. So the timetable was designed in the early part of this year and we took the uh, decision to start communicating it actually as soon as the school, as they, um, school holidays were over because there's really not much point doing concerts. Some in fact, some places never consult in um, August. So we were ready to consult to, um, to communicate in September and that then got interrupted by the morning period. But with the, the planning was done in the early part of the year and the communication began in September. Scott, do you want, just want to pick up on that? Yeah, so um, in terms of the, the stages, there's several stages in a timetable where the operator proposes times to Network Rail. Network Rail then consolidates all of those from all, all trains across the country, both passenger and freight, and ensures that they sit on the network. That, that is called like a bid and offer process. That took place, the finalisation of that actually took place in July. In July, we knew the final plans. We knew that they would start to fit on the network and that they, we also then had performance modelling that said that this would be a, 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 an improved timetable offer. From that period, we go through some of the operational planning around maintenance for trains from depots, the 
the crew diagramming, like to make sure that we've got our resources and everything in the right place, and obviously the important part of passenger communication. This, this year was unfortunately very disrupted, so at the point we were able to communicate, um, our intention was to start communicating prior, uh, about 16 weeks out. Um, however, there were events, um, unfortunately, obviously, with a um, new, new Prime Minister being elected and then the unfortunate passing of the Queen and the mourning period. Actually, those periods created a, a, you know, a delay in our communication externally. So, so many forums like this, our intention was to try and do things with MPs, with user groups, in advance of this being in the public domain before it was into journey planners to explain the, the, the rationale and have a communications plan for that. What we have done since is that you will see there'll be increased communication. We've been leafleting at stations. We've been doing meet the director and meet the manager sessions. Um, Steve said he was at Abbey Wood. I was at Charlton and then Elmer's End. We've got further meet the manager sessions and meet the director sessions taking place on the Bexley Heath and the Sidcup line in the coming weeks. So, you know, we've been doing a multitude of channels to try and communicate this. That will, as we get nearer to the timetable, include radio, information screens, announcements on our trains. You know, so we'll use multiple channels to get that message out there um, because it's been proven that you need to do communication in phases. Too far out, it doesn't land. People don't always... It doesn't really land as well as it could do. People need to hear the information two or three times. So we will be repeating the information via different channels as we lead up to the timetable change. And the only other point I would add, Chair, is that the, uh, the full timetable was in journey planners at 12 weeks out. So that's effectively when, when you can go online, you can look at our app, you can look at national rail inquiries, and you can see the full timetable. And I think that's what happened. Some very eagle-eyed people spotted the changes before any announcements were made. It's been very difficult for people to decipher what changes are being made. Um, and, I mean, if it hadn't been for those few eagle-eyed people, we've got a, the petition was run by a, a local newspaper. It's now got nearly 15,000 signatures. And a lot of those people wouldn't have known about it if it wasn't for... Well, we... we, we... There was a problem with that. When we originally uploaded the timetable, there were some data gaps in it. So some, some of those, uh, that, that particular journalist was involved in telling a story when there were data gaps. There were 300 trains still missing from the timetable when that story broke. So if you look on our website, um, and we've had this in place for a number of weeks now, there is a dedicated section to these changes and there is a page for every single line of route, and there are some frequently asked questions, and it's all on journey planners. So we want to tell everybody about this. We want to tell them the why as well as the what, uh, but we couldn't shout about it until the journey planners were accurate, and unfortunately the first data upload uh, was an erroneous one. Okay, I would also suggest you go back to those pages because I still found them very difficult to decipher. Being, being perfectly honest, trying to figure out how many trains had been cut has taken me hours and hours and hours. <laughs> it has not been, it has not been um, communicated very well on those pages either. Well, we, again, we'd be very happy to take some feedback on that. What we're trying to do is make it very clear. In most areas, you know, there are four trains an hour uh, through, throughout, and, and it, uh, there are pages for each line of route. But if anything isn't clear, please feel, feel free to feed that by, back directly. Okay, I know my panel are itchy, but I've got another couple of questions. Um, I want to talk about the Equalities Impact Assessment and how you've assessed um, the impact to people with access needs and people with buggies. I mean, you mentioned some of the, um, the help in place at London Bridge, but looking at your accessible transport policy, um, it specifically says that you will work with disabled passengers, local communities and local authorities. We understand the importance of involving disabled people in decision making in all aspects of what we do. So can you clarify which Greenwich based disabled people's groups have been approached by your team when making these changes? Uh, no, I can't. 
I don't know if we, if we did. I can check for you who we have consulted with. So we do have our own um, um, accessibility forum that we, do, that we uh, discuss these issues with. And obviously we know our railway and we know the impact. So we, we can look at today's timetable, we can look at the journeys that people make and we can look at tomorrow's timetable and we can understand where we are asking uh, those with accessibility needs to do something differently. Hence the focus that, um, that Scott described on uh, London Bridge and some of the particular additional mitigations that we're putting in place. But we have a head of accessibility and a head of customer experience and they've drafted the equality impact assessment. They've liaised with others in doing so. I don't know on a, whether that's on a borough level or a council level or through the normal forum. But that equality impact assessment is being refined based on the uh, trials that we're running, and it will be finalized before we go live on the 11th of December. Is there anything you want to add? I think, I think just, just to say, in terms of the, the, the impacts, and there are um, testing going on at the moment. So as an example, the flow of the escalators at London Bridge, there was a trial this morning of what escalators go in what direction to look at that. There's reviews around the um, signage that's on the station There's, and the wayfinding. So we're doing some uh, event testing to understand exactly what it's like for people with mobility requirements um, and also the number of people that we need to interchange. So we're doing some testing to make sure that we deliver this well come December the 11th. Um, in terms of you know, doing that, one of those tests is, you know, it, it does involve wheelchair passengers or wheel, wheelchair members to see how long it takes, what challenges are there to make sure we can ensure the right and appropriate um, supporting actions are in place for the timetable change. And, and Chair, we do have some very recent experience of this. Unfortunately, every time there is a strike, we operate a, um, a, a reduced timetable on our metro service. That means that we're running two trains an hour on uh, each of our principal metro routes, but they only go as far as London Bridge. And we've made it very clear throughout that that, that, that railway must be accessible uh, for people on strike day. So London Bridge becomes a terminal destination on a strike day, but we do have, uh, for example, wheelchair users regularly uh, traveling on strike days. On that, another thing that was concerning, concerning me is not just the direct impact on people with accessibility needs, but the indirect impact, for example, cost. So if we take a random off-peak journey um, that I put into the journey planner on Tuesday the 13th of December from Charing Cross to Blackheath, which used to, this used to be direct, and now the suggestion is walking to Embankment, getting the tube to Mansion House, walk to Cannon Street and get the, get the train to Blackheath or have an up to 18 minute wait for a change at Lewisham where the services aren't as good as they are at London Bridge. Um, so there's the accessibility needs problem with that, that you've already talked about with your impact assessment. But what about the cost implications? So a train journey followed by a tube journey is more expensive than a direct train and that's gonna affect an awful lot of people and we are in a cost of living crisis. Yeah, we are. Obviously our proposition is that the journey, the end to end journey can be made by rail with an eight to 10 minute interchange at, um, at uh, London Bridge. So in that scenario, if cost is more important than time, then that is the, the, be the recommended uh, route of traveling and there would be no additional cost. Okay, um, thank you for answering um, all my questions. I'm gonna to move to the panel. Uh, Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, you know, you're going to get a rough ride. You already had a rough ride. You're going to get more of a rough ride. But I do want to say thank you, thank you for coming, especially Mr. White. We haven't, I don't believe, typically had a managing director showing this council, this committee, the respect to attend these meetings. So I appreciate that. But our residents, your customers, feel that they have been shown no respect whatsoever by these sweeping changes introduced without any consultation. I think it's appalling that these changes have been made without consultation. I think it's completely unacceptable that the Department for Transport has allowed you to do this. Um, 
for what it's worth, a point I have made to, min to the Minister for Rail. Um, so you've heard, I, th I think it's very clear that the reaction to this has been more negative than you were expecting. And without meaning to contradict the Chair on the kind of red-blue point earlier, you have achieved something that is quite difficult to do, which is to unite every politician from every party across South East London. My Conservative colleagues, just to save you from any further off-the-cuff remarks <laughs> in Bexley and Bromley are incandescent about this. Mm. Labour colleagues in Labour-run boroughs are incandescent. And that's because our residents have been screwed over here. And given, a, we, and as we've heard, more than 12,000 signatures on SE9 magazine's petition. So given that the reaction has been much more negative than you intended, can I ask, what is to stop you from pressing pause? Your team has told me that the next change will be as early as March. Why not pause and consult now? Okay, let's, so, firstly, I want to apologise. That isn't our intention to establish that reaction. Um, we are trying to build something better, and I recognise the sentiment. And if I had time to consult, you know, I, I, you know that, that's the normal course of action, isn't it? Um, the next timetable goes live on the 11th of December. It is now hardwired in. It cannot be changed at this moment in time. That's because every train operator in the country has agreed their timetable. So the Thameslink trains run to an hour down this line here at um, Greenwich, and they go alongside the four trains an hour we run, and then they run through the core, through Blackfriars, onto the East Coast Main Line, and up to Wellin and Cambridge and Peterborough. So we cannot, we cannot continue with today's timetable, because the timetable that we have for December is the only timetable that fits all operators and all, uh, and all planning is in place to do that. So if it's not legally or technically possible to press pause at this stage in your decision to introduce the timetable, why not press pause on the approach and run a consultation now, between now and March, on the changes before that March change? Okay, well, I think we, we're going to reflect on all the feedback that we've had and we're going to consider whether we can how we can respond to that feedback. Because to, in, rea in reality, we're now running a de facto consultation exercise, aren't we? Not the right way round. But we've told you exactly what we want to do. You can actually try it for yourself on the 11th of December. You can find out how, how, the, how well it does or doesn't work for you. So in, in practice, we've now, we now have that live exercise. And we are, we are taking letters every day and meet, meetings like this there's another one next tuesday and meeting those mps we take we're literally in that listening mode now so uh, just to be clear you are willing to do a consultation between now and march no we, we, we this isn't we, we are now we're listening to you now though i'm calling it a consultation period we are we are listening now to the feedback you're giving us on our timetable so we've I, told I, you what our plans are and we're now listening to what you're telling us. Uh, so, uh, thank you. I really would urge you to carry out a formal consultation period. So, for example, the point about the Elizabeth line was very well made. Had you conducted a consultation, I don't think you would have come here saying that the Elizabeth line is a game changer. The Elizabeth line is not a game changer from the, uh, for my residents in Mottingham, Cold Harbour, New Eltham. We're so far south, the ward is practically in Bromley, and these changes remove... The, our, the, our ward's direct link to Abbey Wood, which is the half-hour loop service. Yeah. So ha, that's what, just one example of how, had you carried out a consultation, you wouldn't have made that mistake in this new timetable. There are hundreds of examples like that. Okay. So can I just urge you to, um, without prolonging the exchange, can I just urge you to, to conduct not a vague listening exercise, but a formal Consultation, and there's nothing vague about this. We are listening to all the feedback that we are getting, including that feedback. And please don't. The Elizabeth Line is a 20 billion pound big railway, but you're right. It, it helps some lines, and it doesn't help others. I fully accept that.
and, and my residents have less access to the Elizabeth line from yeah. the 11th of December. Yeah. Um, that, just moving that, on, because I know... That uh, well made. I, I, I moving on, um, you said that the, uh, that the total cost was £6.2 million a, pound a week, I think you said. What's the cost after the 11th of December? How, many mil how, what, what, how much money is being saved by this new timetable? Um, over, overall, we're running about the same number of services. So South Eastern's timetable... Uh, on the 11th of December is broadly the same as it is now. So the cost is the same after the introduction of the new timetable? Uh, overall, South Eastern, the, the, the saving that we are making, we're running fewer vehicle miles. So that, that's uh, code for being more efficient, for, for, for example, having less empty stock movements, or in some cases, particularly outside the metro area, running slightly shorter trains, maybe an eight-coach train rather than a 12-coach train. So there will be some savings that we can uh, generate from this timetable, but they, you know, in a £1.1 billion business, they aren't significant. Um, on modelling, um, can I ask, uh, can you share or publish the specific modelling that's been done on overcrowding? So... On, where, on many lines, there's a shift from between terminals, um, and uh, what we've uh, heard from South Eastern just doesn't marry with people's post-pandemic experiences of services that in the peak are very overcrowded and will be more overcrowded because of the change in balance of termini being used on lines. So could you, put, could you share and publish the modelling on overcrowding? So I think there's a, there's a couple of ways of doing that. So the ORR publicise uh, usage at stations. Um, I think that is publicly available. I think the latest one covers from March to June of this year. So there is independent um, data available. Apologies. I, I mean modelling of the future overcrowding but that's going to be caused by this timetable. Have you, you modelled the overcrowding from the 11th of December? So, yes, they were the slides that I showed earlier in terms of how many passengers we would expect in December. For specific services. Yes. As I say, that there's yeah. a cons so you can tell me what, how much more we, overcrowded a specific service to Charing Cross will be on the Bexley line. We would, have, we would be able to forecast. People will move differently. So, for example, DLR has put in more services, so that changes people's travel habits. One of the challenges that we are having is people are continuing to try to change their travel habits as things are evolving, whether it be work from home or new services on DLR or Elizabeth Line. So um, we have a forecast. We know, what it, I can, we know exactly what it is today because we weigh people on, to, on and off of trains and we do the manual passenger counts. We do those manual passenger counts twice a year. So we, we have sort of a, an automated way and a sort of verification process. That is then verified and published. The ORR used that, the, these passenger counts to publish on, on services. We will forecast what the demand will be. And in our timetable, we are catering for at least 80% demand by, for that December timetable period. And as you have saw on some of the earlier slides, we are much lower than that. We are at around 60% on the three specific lines that we have at the moment. So perhaps if we could ask the, for that service-specific forecast well, to be it, shared, that would be very helpful it, to help it, our residents understand what they're yeah, facing it, from it, the 11th. It, if I can just unpick a bit, that a bit. So there's, on the Greenwich line, the table was there. There's a seat for everybody in the off-peak, and in the peak, there's space in the timetable in December for almost twice as many people as there are today. So are, are you saying that no train will be overcrowded from the 11th of December? The, Across our peak period, there should be space for everybody. That yes. is quite a bold commitment so, that we'll come back yeah. to, I imagine. Well, can, I, can I just interject there? So every single timetable change that's ever made creates some changes in passenger travel habits. We continually, over every single timetable change ever, review how people are travelling and then try and adapt. Most often, those changes are made with train deployment, so the, the length of trains... So there will undoubtedly be some areas that will become more crowded. The benefit of this timetable is we will be able to adapt and insert more services if that's required easily. 
So if we could perhaps just request that service specific um, data, that would be very useful. And my final general question um, is about communication, that point, because you're right, Chair, um, our residents had to figure this out by, and we had to figure this out, um, and MPs and Assembly members had to figure this out by uh, going on National Rail website and trying to figure out what the services will look like. Um, I do appreciate that the National Mourning Period did have an impact on your communications plans. I don't think um, uh, it is too unreasonable an ask to say that when any timetable changes are made in the future, um, that they are communicated in one package before the timetable goes live so that our residents can understand what's going to happen and we as elected representatives can understand yeah. what's going to happen. I think that's an easy commitment for you to make and it would be great if you could make it. So, yeah. I think we can, we can make that commitment um, to do that. That's what we want to do. This is the normal way that we would want to choose to do things. We, we want to listen. The reason we want to listen is it is incredibly complicated to design a timetable. There will be things like school flows. There will be some things around local businesses or travel that may, we may get wrong. We want to listen. Consultation for us helps us as well. So we want to consult. The only sort of slight caveat that I would say be, would be if anything happened in terms of government guidance, you know, we're out of the... We're out of the pandemic, but if they are the type of scenarios where we would have to make changes if demand, you know, if something really drastic happened. But, you know, our intent would always be to consult. That's what we want to do. Uh, it's our commitment that 12 weeks before the timetable goes live, it appears in Journey Planner, and where we're making changes several weeks before that, we want to fully explain those changes, load up the FAQs on our website, give you a PDF of the timetable before it becomes a live journey planner. And we plan to do that at the beginning of September, but unfortunately we're overtaken by events. But we, uh, you know, we do apologize that this had a false start. But if you look online now, we, we're hoping that there is very clear line of route information. Okay, thank you. Councillor Williams. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to say that whatever way you try and spin this, the bottom line is this plan is detrimental to our residents. Their ability to go to work, their ability to enjoy their leisure time, um, and I can only uh, concur with uh, what's been said about consultation, and I really hope that I can believe what you've said about taking comments on board, and that this isn't just a a listening exercise so that you can say that you've been and you've listened, but you're going to carry on regardless. Because for our residents and for us, that is not going to wash. Um, I'd like to probe a bit further about the equalities impact assessment, firstly. You say it's been drafted and will be published shortly in or around December the 11th when the new timetable comes into effect and that you've been doing testing. I'd be grateful if you can tell us where you've been testing, how you've been testing, who has been testing, because you said, we know our railway, which is actually quite arrogant. We have brilliant user groups in this borough who, who understand their needs better than anybody else, and I appreciate that you say you have your own um, testing group, um, but to be implementing changes to uh, communities who, as the chair has said, may well find it far harder to commute by um, virtue of their, their needs, to, to not involve them in any change to the timetable, any policy changes, is, is quite frankly outrageous. And you mentioned wheelchair users, but you haven't mentioned anybody else that might have a disability. Um, and it's a far broader group than, than just that. Also concerned about the overall cost as well in terms of additional journeys. And on one of the slides, it said um, around additional people, um, additional people at your at London Bridge, I think, um, to aid with, with uh, mobility. I assume that's to guide people, to help people uh, transfer between platforms, how many of those people are there going to be and what additional and robust training are they going to have? Um, so that, that's, that's me for a start of 10, but there's more. Okay. So 
So in terms of the training for the, our teams, we have a mobile assistance team across Southeastern that are currently deployed when we get pre-booked assistance. So that is a team of around 25 people that are deployed as needed for this chain. They are fully trained in helping people of all that need whatever kind of assistance, whether that be visually impaired, whether that be luggage, whether that be uh, wheelchair bound. So a multitude of training aspects are given to those teams. We've actually trained everyone in our, every customer facing person in our business has had accessibility training to help with the wider network because it's, you know, it, th this is, it's good. We are getting more and more um, people traveling. We have actually got more people traveling now with accessibility needs than we had prior to COVID. So that is a good news story with people coming to rail. So we have trained all of our frontline people in that. So I think that's, you know, it's quite a commitment and we have done that. And from December, we will have, as well as all of the other people that are in place currently, so we've dealt with around 3,000 um, uh, assistance requests in the last six months at London Bridge. And we have done that with the team. We are adding two more people, AM, and two more people, PM, to deal with the um, forecast increase from December. Um, you, you said two different things there. You said everybody in the business has had accessibility training. Customer-facing people. And then you said customer-facing people. So it's just customer-facing. Yeah, so it's a, it's a few thousand people. We've got our, all of the people on stations. Um, different levels of training depending on your level of interaction. So the highest level being you work on a station or a platform at, say, London Bridge. If you are a train driver, that's a different level of training. If you work in engineering, again, that's a slightly different level. So that's, okay. you know, our policy has been to give the appropriate training to everyone around this. And it's a very comprehensive program that's normally provided by, um, for example, a wheelchair user or a visually impaired person or an autistic person. So we try and make it very authentic training. And I've been through that training and so have my executive team. You know, that we, was my we, next question. We, we, um, we, I did similar training when I was at, at TFL. We did similar training at GTR. We have worked hard with our accessibility panel. So what have we done this year? We've reduced the booked assistance uh, window down to two hours. We've introduced access for all in the last uh, uh, three more uh, stations. Uh, we, you know, this, we think in the weekend before the state funeral, we probably did more assistance than we've ever done before in our history, and that's a positive thing. That's something we take seriously and we want to build on. That's, that is good to hear, which leads me on to questions about Lewisham and people that want to change there. One of the issues that has been brought to me um, by residents and by friends about these changes is the fact that the lifts at Lewisham are forever not working. They are out of service more often than they are in service. So what will be done to ensure that um, being able to change at Lewisham is easier for people with buggies, for people with wheelchairs, for people with hefty suitcases? Um, and staying on the issue of, of I guess, Lewisham in particular, um, on, again, on one of the slides, you mentioned about safety and about additional security, and you say it's going to be there until 10 o'clock. Now, is that suggesting that nothing bad ever happens after 10? Or, um, or is it that just you're not prepared to have the additional staff after then? I think security and safety of passengers is really quite important. I hope you would agree. Um, so surely having those additional staff on until the last train has left would be more appropriate. It's okay. Appreciate there is a cost implication um, to that but I'm not sure that's a reason. Okay, so um, if I deal with the security issue and I'll ask um, Scott to pick up Lewisham as an interchange point because primarily for people going to, who want to go to Charing Cross rather than Cannon Street, we're recommending London Bridge rather than Lewisham as the interchange point because for some of the reasons you pointed out, it's just so much better to that effect. On the issue of uh, security and anti-social anti behavior, I'd be interested in the views of, the, uh, of, of yourselves, but we see this as a problem. 
and a problem that we need to address in society and a problem that affects our railway. So we have secured, with the help of the Department for Transport, additional funding uh, for eight hours a day, uh, seven days a week, at the 19 kilo stations. So then we've looked at all the data and said, where do uh, most of the issues occur? And actually, it's not between 11 o'clock and midnight. It's often between two and three and four in the afternoon. So we've determined that the best shift to, to have maximum additional impact. Remember, this is already on top of the four and a half thousand people that Southeastern already employ and the relationship that we have with the British Transport Police. These additional resources are best targeted for maximum safety benefit between 2 p.m. and 10 p.m. But we will keep an eye on the data, and if we need to flex those times, we will do so. They are a, a flexible resource, but they are additional, and they are, as I say, they, they will make a difference to our, to our customers and to our colleagues. And in that case, I think I would request that, if possible, this panel see that data as well, so that... If you're asking for us to offer an opinion, we would, we would need that information. Yeah, we'd be very happy to share that. So I'm just going to ask Scott to talk about Lewisham as an interchange location. So in terms of the interchange at Lewisham, a very similar approach to try and make that as dependable as possible. As Steve said, we're encourage, we will be encouraging London Bridge as the point to interchange for two reasons. One, the, the station, the facilities, but also the frequency of train service. So if you're interchanging, there'll be many more trains. There'll be a train every few minutes to get into, um, you know, the London Termini where you need the interchange. For Lewisham, we are doing the same thing. We're looking at the lifts, the reliability, staffing for, um, to make sure that we've got people in place to uh, make that as smooth as possible um, once the timetable change uh, happens. So... Basically, we're treating Lewisham in the same vein as we are treating London Bridge. The slides represented London Bridge because, obviously, it's going to be the major interchange. And my very last question. Um, I'm really quite surprised you haven't mentioned anything about climate change. Um, this is, obviously, uh, public transport. Um, as an authority, we are very keen that um, we that residents use public transport over cars. And I guess, had you done a consultation, one of the questions that you could have asked would have been, if we implement this new timetable, will you continue to use our trains or will you get back in your cars and drive into central London? And I think that is a huge missed opportunity um, not to do a consultation and we're not going to rehash what's already been said. But have you done any modelling on how many... How many um, passengers will scrap your service altogether, vote with their feet and start driving back into London or back to work um, instead, of, instead of continuing to use the train. So in terms of, like, we're continuing to monitor, we can, we can really mod monitor what's happening on our trains, right? you know, so we have ways of doing that accurately. In terms of modelling the wider social impact and the, the, the climate impact of people returning to car, I think our, our approach is to make a timetable that's scalable. And that's important. Pre creating that space is the way for us to make sure that people do not choose the car across the whole entire network and making, as all of the researchers said, that punctuality and reliability is the biggest driver of satisfaction across our whole network, not just the, the, the lines that we are talking about here. And obviously, so we will continue to monitor how people are travelling and make sure that we provide the space so that that can continue to grow and take people away from cars. It's, it's very fair to say we cannot model with any degree of accuracy some of these changes. You know, how many people are going to stop working from home? When the fuel prices went through the roof we would have expected that to see to drive a lot more people onto the railway. It didn't happen. When the fares were put up last year, it didn't have a material impact on the number of people travelling. So it's very difficult in this post-COVID world to accurately predict uh, the, the um, choices that people will make uh, in terms of when they travel and how they travel. But I can tell you, at an overall 
southeastern level, um, we believe that this um, timetable will generate more customers and more revenue. So that's overall, not just Metro, overall than the timetable we have today. But that's, that's as granular as we can get. And that's driven principally by the historic view that a more punctual railway tends to attract more customers and tends to build revenue. But that doesn't work at a granular level, it only works at a macro level, I accept that. But the high level assumption is that this will help the railway grow. One last comment. You say you can't model with any accuracy, yet had you have done a consultation, you could have asked all of these questions, which would have given you a greater picture of the need of our residents. And I just don't feel that, that you're kind of understanding that you had the opportunity to ask the people that use the railways every day for whatever reason. And at some high level that you said, you said it wasn't a unilateral decision. It was a decision made by incredibly senior people um, not, to, not to consult, which, and I, I agree that this, I think, has backfired on you far, far greater than you ever expected. And I, yeah. Councillor Hannan. Thank you. Um, I just want to pick up on that last point that you made, that you think that the changes you've made will help with growth. So I just want to understand a little bit more what your strategy for growth is. Um, you know, you're saying that these changes are going to lay the foundation for growth. You've heard today what people want. They don't necessarily want punctuality. They want frequency, and they want to be able to get to where they want to without making those changes. Knowing that, understanding that the way you're going to... you still think that you're going to attract or have encourage more journeys through this approach? How are you going to bring passengers back from their cars onto your railway with this approach when you've heard, heard loud and clear that passengers want frequency? So there, there are a number of facets to that. Um, we want to make this an attractive railway, so hence the security staff to try and reduce antisocial behaviour. That may be one of the reasons why some people might not make a journey or might not make a journey on their own or might not make a journey at a certain time of the day. So we want to make this railway more secure. We want to make this railway more accessible. That's why that list of access for all schemes that I put in, you know, is on the list. We want that to be the case. We want people to think they've got a fair deal. So if they are delayed, we want to give them com uh, their compensation readily and willingly and easily so that this becomes a fair deal. As customers come back, we'll want to build our service so that the frequency of services matches the the demand that we're actually seeing on our railway. And we want to exploit all of the opportunities that come with, you know, the, uh, the interchanges that might be possible. So the DLR are running additional services. You know, the Elizabeth line helps in some areas, but not others. Uh, we want to remove first class travel so that every single seat is available for every single customer at no additional cost to the taxpayer. Uh, we want to replace the rolling stock. So uh, the class three seven sixes are fully refurbished. So when you get on that train, you get a better perception of value for money and you can see that we care about the environment that you travel in. I want the 12 trains that are currently at Southwestern to come over to these metro services so you've got some new air-conditioned trains. If next summer is like this summer, I want more air-conditioned trains on your railway. So we're doing a whole series of measures that are designed to make our railway grow in the future. Um, I recognise that some journeys, particularly to Waterloo East and to Charing Cross, now require an interchange. We need to reflect on that. I fully appreciate that, and I apologise for the fact that we didn't consult. And that may affect our revenue, and we will look at what we can do about that. But in every area that we can, we want to build a, a, a better uh, railway a, and a growing railway over time. And I, th I think we appreciate those considerations, and I don't think anybody would, would argue with those focus areas, but I, I think 
the point that we've made here is that they're all great and they're nice to have, but the essential point is people do not want to go to a station and wait half an hour for their train, and that is going to turn away from your service. That's going to be a huge factor that they consider in whether they want to continue using the train. So I'll leave it there. I think we've made that point quite clear. Um, so I want to pick up on another point that you made, which is that these changes that you've introduced are not necessarily going to generate significant savings or create significant efficiencies, which I find quite astounding. You're reducing our service significantly in this area without the rationale for making savings because of the reduction in journeys. You've provided a very clear presentation on how we've reduced service in this area by 40 percent, and no, yet your changes are not generating those efficiencies to justify that, but yet reducing but, our service. So, no, we, the 40% the was the reduction in demand. That's how many people are travelling this year compared to three years ago. You know, and a lot of the railway today has four trains an hour. Two might go to Cannon Street, two might go to Charing Cross, and tomorrow we'll still have four trains an hour, but they'll all go to Cannon Street. The Hayes Line actually has an extra train in the morning peak. You know, so this is not, um, this is not one dimensional. The, the biggest loss for people that we are describing is the loss of having the option to go to two London termini. I, I do sincerely understand that. So we are asking people to trade off a, 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 a more punctual service for for an, for an interchange, and we've heard from the audience that you know, a lot of people don't want to do that. Uh, but this is not a, this is not, the, the table we showed you said there's, there's typically four trains an hour on our railway, so you shouldn't have to wait more than circa 15 minutes. It should be a turn up and go railway. The, but the downside compared to today is it goes to one London Termini, not two. Well, on my line from Mays Hill, you're reducing the service from six to four an hour, and I believe yeah. that this going down on other services as well from people that are represented here. So there is a reduction in the number of trains, and it will mean longer waits on the stations. Well, yeah, um, obviously the reduction in some areas is where we've tailored the timetable for how people are travelling today. So using where I said, uh, I think Steve said earlier, the timetable is broadly the same size as the one that's operating today. But using that as an example, some of those trains where there has been a 40% reduction in the amount of passengers are being used on things like the Beckenham Junction to Blackfriars service where we've seen a requirement for customers there. So, so it's a, the, the, the trains are being deployed in a different way because people are traveling differently. So, so that reduction has basically moved, those trains have moved to somewhere else. Okay. I mean, I think we've made the point for that where we are, we're not benefiting from other lines like the Elizabeth line. So commuters are significantly impacted by this reduction. We don't have an alternative route directly into London, and it will deter people from using the trains. It's not just going to move them onto a different service. But anyway, I think we've made that point. My last question is just on the trains that you're no longer going to be using, or I understand that the ones that they'll just be shifting to a different line and not necessarily being kind of uh, taken out of service and therefore not able to return back if you do increase services. No, the, the overall size of our rolling stock fleet in December is the same size that it is today. Thank you. Councillor Asgar. Hi. Thank you, Steve, for coming. I think maybe I'll give Steve a bit of a breather and I'll go to Alex first. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we bought him. It didn't work, did it? There should be our timetable expert just here, but I'm afraid he couldn't uh, make it for personal reasons. Hi, Alex. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, just a, a, quick, a couple of quick questions. First one is... Can you confirm it's Network Rail who are delivering the Access for All scheme, not South Eastern? Um, obviously, South Eastern have helped because it's their station, so they have to give the nod and be on board with, no pun intended, with the, um, with the design, but it is a Network Rail scheme. Am I, am I right? 
So I think different schemes are delivered in different ways. Certainly Network Rail do take a uh, sponsor and project management, uh, Southeast and nominate the stations, but um, Network Rail uh, do um, yeah, manage the delivery of the project and uh, through their contractors. Thank you. And my um, second question to you is, um, in your presentation, and thank you, um, you said there's a, an ambition to enhance capacity and an aim to lengthen trains. And I think everybody who lives on the Woolwich line and probably the Bexley Heath line as well, and Sickup line, has been wanting those longer trains for quite some time. Uh, the platforms were lengthened um, at, at the stations probably a decade ago. And we don't get any bigger than the biggest on the Woolwich line is a 10 car networker. Um, and obviously the GTR trains are fixed units at eight, uh, but GTR aren't here today. Um, so I did hear something um, at some point about well, we couldn't put um, longer trains on that line anyway because the sidings aren't big enough. Is, is that true or is that an urban myth? So I think there's a, there's a number of points there. The 10 car networkers would uh, come from Woolwich Dockyard that is only uh, 10 cars long and has the tunnel at both ends. And the networkers, we said, are 30 years old and they don't have what's called selective door opening. So um, if they stop at Woolwich Dockyard, those trains, they can't be any longer. From the concept, the longer term concept of longer trains will meet the demand forecast as they go over the next 10 years or so. So um, the, um, Steve um, has um, adequately said how they're sizing the, the service for what is needed now, but what we are looking at is when you get more jobs and growth coming in South London and more people traveling, what is the trajectory going forward over the next 10, 20, 30 years that will then need the uh, extra capacity? Sure, so at this point, are the sidings at Plumstead and Slate Green, which serve the Woolwich line, are they big enough to take 12 car trains? Um, well, um, Slade Green, I think, uh, is still mainly a 10 car. They manage 12 cars through shunting the units and separating up, up the units. Um, and yeah, it would have, um, I'm sure Southeastern colleagues would um, dearly love to have the 12 car uh, sidings so they can better use the rolling stock. But they do manage to service 12 car trains on the route through um, they're um, very clever working inside the depot to um, split and join trains. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. Steve, 12 car city beam, please. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to write um, that down. Yep, yep. Excellent. Um, okay. So, um, but I'm not going to express my indignation at lack of consultation. That's been done, got the tea towel. However, um, Steve, you, I know it's not you making the decision not to consult. You said it came from elsewhere, possibly ministerial level, I don't know, whoever's in charge. But how did that make you feel? Did you ask why are we not to consult? Uh, if, if I'm honest, I, I'm accountable for this railway, so I'm not going to pass the book. I have done something that I have formal approval not to do, which is not to um, consult. But we've developed our timetable uh, in the same way do, that fares policies are developed in the same way that um, other railway changes are made, you know, in regular contact with the department. So we have made these changes um, with, with a sincere attempt to, to start building a railway which in the long term can be better than the railway you have today. Um, but I, I'm not going to say that... that uh, I, I'm the managing director, therefore I'm accountable for that. I've apologized for the fact that we didn't consult. We are listening now to the detail of the, of the feedback that we get, um, but the time did not allow us. What, what I am clear of, it would not have been appropriate to do a disingenuous, consult, a disingenuous consultation where we were out of time to, to make changes. So the, the timetable time in December is now 
a timetable that we cannot change, but we can make changes downstream. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to ask about the, uh, the sort of uh, the shift in people's working habits, and maybe this is one for Scott. Um, and I understand the rationale, a lot more people are working from home, not that not as many people are commuting, but it is still standing room only in the morning. And it is still standing room, it's standing room only on the Elizabeth line in the morning as well. Um, but, um, and I know you guys got seats uh, coming down here, so that was great. Um, but um, just the way how, I know an on paper exercise saying, eight to 10 minute change, it's just an eight to 10 minute change. That can make a hell of a difference to someone's quality of life in the morning. If you've got to get your kids to the breakfast club or you've just got to get to work, and that eight to 10 minutes change, I'd probably rather sit on that embankment at St. John's, which I do very often, so often I was thinking of having my mail directed there, but I don't need to now. Um, but it, it's, I think it's, um, you know, it's a bit of a fait accompli now, really, because the decision's been made. Nothing we say is going to change it for December. Um, but I, just, I would just like you to, it's not really a question, but I really would like, on behalf of everybody, <laughs> um, that eight to ten minutes change at London Bridge isn't, isn't that simple. It can make a hell of a difference to your, and the time you get home in the evening, time you spend with your family. It can, it can really, you know, change someone's quality of life. Also, um, um, just just on on that um, the um, working from home do you think that might change over this winter in particular with a lot more people opting to go to the office but so they don't have to put the heating on at home I'll be honest I don't know um, one of the one of the challenges that is one school of thought um, and that's one of the reasons we, there is space on every line in the morning peaks in that in that table there is space for people more people than we've currently got so that's one of the factors that we've we've put into the plan because we don't know you know what we have seen over the last steve described we've made over 15 changes at different paces as a result of the pandemic and people's travel habits are changing you know we you can come to work on a train and one thursday it's really busy and the next Thursday, the same train is not busy. It's really, really difficult to understand what future patterns are going to be. So our approach has been make a very simple timetable that we can scale up if people come back. Can I, can I just add, it's, it's, this is a great little um, microcosm of what we're wrestling with. I've heard two different arguments. One is that people will come to the office more often this, this winter in order to keep warm. And the second is that employers will say to uh, their, their employees, please carry on working from home, save the cost of your journey, and put it towards your fuel, bill, fuel, your fuel bills. Controversial. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask about capacity. Um, I was at the Southeastern Stakeholder Meeting in autumn 2019, maybe October, November time. And we all sat there and did a little survey. We had little buttons that we pressed and there was a bar chart on the screen that went up. And it, and it said, what is more important to you? And it was capacity or punctuality. And overwhelmingly, the answer was capacity. People would rather have a seat or you know, trains that are sufficient for their journey, you know, rather than maybe being a couple of minutes late, um, which doesn't correspond with what your presentation says. It says that punctuality is what people want more, but not at that stakeholder meeting. Can, can I ask when that was done? Yeah, autumn 2019. Yeah. I mean, in, in autumn 2019, in those pre-COVID uh, worlds, all the railways in the southeast were fighting for capacity, weren't there? There's Croydon remodelling and flyovers being built and city beam trains that, are, that carry more customers and Thameslink walk through a uh, rolling stock that looks like a tube train and can carry more people in an eight-coach train than we've ever imagined. So, you know, we, the railway pre-COVID was always fighting against having sufficient capacity for growth which had been 
you know, compound growth for 25 years since the mid-1990s. More and more people were living in London. More and more people were travelling every day. As central London employment went up, uh, we, we got more customers, and we were constantly fighting for capacity to deal with that. You know, all those schemes that uh, Alex had, they're all, they're all on hold now. No one's building railway capacity now. There's even questions about, you know, do we need HS2 now or in five years' time or in ten years' time? So we've switched the, the capacity argument now for, you know, fr frankly trying to give people what they've always wanted. Councillor Asgar, can I ask this one last question? One last, one last question, yeah. So the, um, you said nobody's building any more, there's no more capacity being built in rail, but there's a lot of properties being built, especially in areas like Thamesmead and Abbey Wood, um, which the, the Elizabeth Line, I think, has been seen here as a magic bullet. That's just, that means we can cut trains. You know, uh, you were saying, uh, Scott, that the DLR are putting on more trains, but they're building, there's going to be another station between West Silvertown and Canning Town. That's going to soak up those extra trains. Um, the new properties that are being built, that's going to soak up the Elizabeth Line. We're going to be back where we started. And if the DLR comes to Thamesmead, I can envisage in a few years' time, if we do get the DLR to Thamesmead, which would be amazing, you might sit here saying, we don't need any more trains because we've got the DLR to Thamesmead now, just as you're saying today that the Elizabeth Line is, is, is here to save us all. So what will you do long term? To, because they aren't really magic bullets. They were meant to be in addition to, and they're being used as replacements. So um, earlier on in the slides, I, I presented the, the passenger numbers in December, which used in the morning peak. If I, I just reiterate that, there was about 15,000 um, people traveling in the morning peak. Um, the current demand is 7,000. So it's about half, which is something that Steve has said. The capacity that we've got in the December plan is for 16,000 people. So one of the benefits of this timetable is that we can monitor how that growth happens and what route it happens on and deploy services how people are travelling with us. With the existing timetable, that video with things weaving in and out, it is not possible to simply just add odd services here and there. And what we will be able to do is target particular times of day with additional capacity where it's needed. So as that starts to grow, I talked um, earlier about the Beckenham Junction situation. That is a perfect example of where this timetable is simpler and we've deployed the, the space where it's needed. We'll continue to do that. In the longer term, as Alex has said, there is a point where growth will need more trains. It will need the longer trains, the new trains, of which we're working together to try and get. And I suppose well, I'll, I'll just add that working with uh, your transport officers throughout the London boroughs is something that we do want to do to understand where the, where the growth is, how we can improve the access to the stations, where are the tower blocks going to go? Sometimes, you know, it, it's a bit mixed, but sometimes we get really good information of shape files of where, you know, new, uh, major new uh, housing developments are going. But trying to then match a railway service um, to that is quite challenging. And so this is why we do want to work with all the, the London boroughs about how we best manage the demand on a London-wide basis. Okay, thank you very much. My uh, constituents in Plumstead Common use Welling and they use uh, Plumstead and they use Woolwich and, you know, it's, it is really going to affect them. And it, a choice of termini is why people chose to settle where they settled and now they've only got one. So it's, it is a real shame and let's see where we are in six months' time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Selden. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming tonight. It is a treat to have you. Um, I've got a question around the data and your usage of data. So one of the things you seem to have relied on quite a lot is the, uh, on your, it was on your slide eight, the transport focus uh, data. Um, now I note from that that it was taken between, is it the 8th to 12th of December 2021? which was a pretty abnormal time in terms of journeys and travel. It was pretty much the height of COVID. Uh, how have you addressed uh, the natural 
difficulties that it would present to your data set and the reliability of it. Um, so this was the most recent external data point. So we do internal monitoring of satisfaction. We, we understand, you know, we ask customer groups what um, drives their satisfaction. But actually, we wanted to use external. So similar to the numbers of passengers using trains, we used the ORR because it was the latest independent data set. So in a similar vein, this, this piece of research was done because passenger priorities changed during COVID. Things like cleanliness of the train became a higher priority than it had been historically. Level of crowding on a train became a higher priority. But even in that research, none of them were to the levels of punctuality and reliability. So. Uh, the, the thing I was, uh, was adding, we do customer surveys literally every week. We have a customer insights team uh, led by Howard and he gives us a weekly report on customer satisfaction and an insight. We ask our customers to rank the things that they find most important about the journey. And punctuality and reliability always comes top. And it comes top not by a little bit, but by a long way. To the, to the extent that if a customer is delayed by 10 minutes or more, their satisfaction falls 35%. You know, we brief, you know, that, that, that's the latest data, you know, this autumn on customers' perception. Actually, if, they, um, if they're more than 15 minutes late rather than 10 minutes late, it doesn't get any worse because they start to get a bit of del delay repay. But from 10 minutes onwards, customer satisfaction is dramatically lower than it is with a punctual railway. So what I took from that is that even though the data is from 2021 December, if we look to the data today, it would show me pretty much the same picture. Uh, in terms of the, the priority of um, performance, yes, it would. Okay, so the second question concerning this graph again is uh, when I look at it, uh, the question uh, doesn't seem to be answered by the answer. So it says the importance of journey aspects versus satisfaction rating with those individual journey aspects. But when I look at the answer as that are given, it actually appears to be saying dissatisfaction with aspects of my journey versus in, uh, the individual journey aspects. So if my train was delayed by 10 minutes, then I'd be very unhappy about that. Currently, we are operating, say, on the Woolwich line, I believe eight trains an hour at peak time. Now, the plans to reduce that is likely to uh, promote the frequency of trains running on that route higher up. Would you not agree? different impact oh, sorry in terms of different lines I think there will be different impacts so and so whilst I use that as an example I would say generally if you reduce the number of services on a line then customer dissatisfaction associated with the frequency of those services on that line is going to increase no not the dissatisfaction so if we use uh, more recent examples there was a recast of the southern metro timetable um, in uh, a few years ago and that reduced the frequency of services on a lot of lines and punctuality increased for on time by about 20 percent and passenger satisfaction increased by over 10 percent that's using the transport focus research not our not our own just to clarify what i think i've heard you say is that people aren't going to mind the number of services being reduced on their line once it rely operates reliably yes that's correct based on previous surveys by transport focus I can tell you for not very much effort that the 21 minute journey time uh, time between trains on stations like Westcom Park and replicated elsewhere across the network are going to lead to a significant amount of uh, dissatisfaction they're also going to lead to a reduction in the use of transport interchanges like uh, Greenwich which actually you see an awful lot of people getting on at stations in between in order to use that, which they're now going to be pushed onto buses or possibly cars. Uh, I dread to think what might happen then. Can I, I say the devil's in the detail here, but for example, at Abbey Wood uh, today, there are 12 trains an hour. At uh, Abbey Wood in December, as I'm sure that you'll, if you give any time to your TFL uh, person tonight, he'll tell you it will drop to eight, but dropping from 12 to 8, I still think will we'll give a very high level of customer satisfaction. So you're right, there might be individual points where 
we've been, gone below a threshold which is, which is uh, tolerable, uh, and we will uh, examine what that looks like. So there, there, there may be some nuances in the data. So I think you might be missing my point, because what I'm actually talking about is the gaps between the services. Yeah, so no, you, so I you appreciate could run that. six trains an hour, but if they were one minute apart and I'd wait 54 minutes, I'd be pretty, it would be a pretty useless railway. So it's those gaps that I'm concerned that we are not addressing and the impact that that will have Correct. on the and, and, those and lines. On most of our railway, we're typically four trains an hour, and the gaps uh, that we have today between our railway that sometimes goes to Cannon Street and sometimes goes to Charing Cross are more off-pattern than some of the gaps that we have tomorrow on, on the new timetable. I worked it out for, for somebody who gave me a very specific specific uh, request on one of the lines. So we are trying to keep towards that even interval um, four trains an hour where we can. There are exceptions to that where it doesn't work, but that's typically what most customers will see. But again, you've said four trains an hour, and what I'm talking about is regularity uh, of the gaps between those. Y yes. And it's interesting for you to tell me about the four trains per hour across your network, but you are actually at the London Borough of Greenwich transport panel so our focus is going to be this in this part of London in particular and that's one of the significant concerns I've heard coming back I appreciate that but obviously I'm in parts of the lines here that, that you represent that you know, you, there will be the four trains an hour but not at every station uh, thank you chair I think I've got all the answers I'm going to get okay thank you um my next proposal was to go line by line, but does any of the panel members have questions that they desperately want to ask line by line, just conscious of time? I've got one line specific question. Can, can we just give an indication of, of timing in your proposed closure? I think we were scheduled for an 8.30 finish. Happy to give more time, but it'd be helpful to know. Um, I think if we can give some more time to some of the people who have come out, that would be, be really great. Okay, so what, when, what time are you likely to propose closing? Half nine? Nine fifteen? <laughs> Given the lack of consultation. Let's, let's keep going. Thank you, Chair. Um, my line-specific question relates to the Sidcup line, um, and it's just coming back to this point about the, the loss of the 30 uh, half-hourly loop service, Cannon Street to Cannon Street, that links the Sidcup line to the Woolwich line. Now, this wasn't um, uh, communicated at all um, in the package of comms that you did come out with. I think it's kind of happened almost by accident. I think for pl your planners looking at the timetable, it probably looks like a bit of a weird a weird kind of aberration on the network, but it's actually a really important link. The biggest strategic transport challenge in this borough is the lack of north-south transport links. We're very well connected east-west, and the links to the south of the borough, which I represent, um, is, uh, are, are dreadful. So these changes on the 11th of December remove the half-hourly loop service. That is used, that is the, the um, only uh, direct link to the Elizabeth line. So as I said earlier, you're taking away my residents' uh, access to the huge benefits of the Elizabeth line uh, to get on at Abbey Wood. It's used by Charlton fans all along the Sidcup line to get to the valley. It's used uh, by students to get to the Avery Hill campus of Greenwich University. And so I, I think looking at, and again, you know, not to go back there, another reason consultation would have shown that this isn't just a weird aberration in the, in the timetable. It's a really, really important loop service uh, for the south of the borough. So, you know, we've given you lots of kind of things to hopefully consider. Um, can I really make a plea that you take that very specific point away and see if you can, you know, whatever other changes you make, make sure that we get that loop line back for the benefit of, of our residents in the south of the borough? Yeah, I'll give that commitment and we'll look at that. Um, the, the way that the free lines have been operated is to provide like four trains per hour, but I totally recognise your point and we'll take that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. I um, appreciate that time is running on. So what I propose to do <clears throat> is if we can start with the amenity groups, please. So anyone representing um, a rail user group or a disability group. Um, have we got a roving mic? Yeah. So if you could just put your hand up. Uh... Thanks. I represent 
the Western Society, um, our local stations are Westcombe Park and Mays Hill. We're at the south side of the Greenwich Line. But to the Greenwich Line lost their train cost services um, before the London Bridge rebuild. And changing at London Bridge is a pain. And many people actually go to Blackheath in order to avoid it. People, also, people go to Blackheath in, to avoid changing at, Char at London Bridge to get to Charing Cross. But more importantly, people also go to Blackheath to access King's Hospital, which is one of our network of hospitals that serves this area. And if you remember, you may, I presume you're aware, I know that some of your colleagues are aware, that back, I think in 2017, very similar proposals to all of these were actually consulted on. And there was huge, huge um, opposition to it, and the changes didn't go ahead. You say that you haven't had time to consult, but other companies changing the timetable in December have consulted, so I don't buy that. The, to go back to the Greenwich line, you say that you're aiming at a, a metro-type turn-up-and-go service. We, pre-COVID, we had got to the stage, 20 years ago, we had two trains an hour to Charing Cross. Pre-COVID, we got to the stage of having six trains an hour off-peak at 10-minute at intervals. Brilliant metro service. Four of them were Cannon Street, two of them were Thameslink. Now, we're lucky in that we've gained the Thameslink, and I admit, and we would never want to lose that. That has been a huge bonus. But it shows how important all these different links are. are. But our service has now gone down to two Cannon Streets an hour and two Thames Links an hour with a 20-minute gap, two 20-minute gaps, a 20-minute gap and a 10-minute gap. That we have been asking ever since that happened, either to go back to six trains an hour or to have the, back, the gap bettered and have a 15-minute service. In the new timetable, one, two gaps, I think the ones going up to town, are becoming 23 minutes. So basically, we're going to have a gap of 23 minutes and then seven minutes. That is not a metro service. That is going back to what we had 20 years ago where it was nearly, it was half an hour. I mean, it's nearly half an hour. That is the sort of gap that people, when the journey itself is shorter than the gap, and that is the sort of gap where people will start looking for other ways to go. Because it, you, can't, you can't just think, oh, I need to go and get a train now. It, it's totally unacceptable. Um, I think, so, one question that people don't seem to have asked yet is you say that you are going, this is only one change. There are going to be new changes in the, in the future. You also have said that it's too late now to consult on this and that we've got to put up with it in December. So how long do we wait before you're going to have the changes? How long are those people who live in South of the borough going to have to wait before they can get back on a train to get round the north. How long do we have to wait to go back to metro sites? You're going to lose people in the meantime who start to use their cars and things. Give us some hope. Tell us when we're going to get our services improving again because at the moment they're going back. I'm sorry, your area has been particularly uh, badly affected by this. I do acknowledge that. I can't give you a timescale when it will um, change. As you know, timetables currently now change uh, twice a year. So we, at the moment, we are planning our change for December. We're listening to all this feedback, and then we will identify when we can change it. So I can't confirm tonight uh, what changes will come and when, but the next normal 
timetable change will be uh, May of next year, unless we do something specific in the interim. We might be able to make small changes in uh, March, but um, May, uh, bigger changes could not be possible before May. So what, what we know today is the timetable that will operate in December. And I know it has the downsides that you've described. I acknowledge that and I apologize for the fact that it will give you in your station less of a service than you have today. But we will reflect on that and when we know what future changes we can make, we will share that as soon as we can. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Mike Sparr. I'm, I'm here from the Greenwich Line Users Group, and we represent people that use the stations at Deptford, which I know isn't in this borough, uh, Greenwich, Mays Hill, and Westcombe Park. And the point I wanted to, to make was that I picked up the evening standard coming here uh, tonight, and there's a nice advert there from South Eastern, all 11th change, and it says, Space on trains, where it's needed most. Oh, wonderful. Nirvana. Excellent. The only problem is the number of peak hour trains along our line is actually going to be halved. The Southeastern are reducing the number of their trains from four to two. With the tentering trains as well, obviously that makes a total of four an hour instead of six an hour. How is that providing space where it's needed most? Now, in January this year, um, our trains were getting very crowded because the service had been cut back during COVID. On the 31st of January this year, South Eastern, very good of them, reintroduced the peak hour 10-minute frequency of services. That is why you probably were able to all sit down tonight because before then you couldn't sit down. And I know that from personal experience and from what our supporters have said. Now, having only reintroduced those services at the end of January, you are taking them out again. So why do you think that the result is going to be any different? That you put the services in, it helped with overcrowding, you're going to take the services out, what do you think is going to happen? Overcrowding. So why put in the evening press space on trains where it's needed most? Because there clearly isn't. So I think this cut in the peak hour service along the Greenwich Line is uncalled for, and I think it's unnecessary. Um, and as my colleague has already said, uh, of course, um, these similar changes to these were consulted on in 2016 by the Department for Transport. Now you're a Department for Transport-owned company. I'm a bit suspicious as to why these are suddenly re-emerged as proposals. There was widespread opposition then. Why do you think there wouldn't be widespread opposition now? Excuse me, this is uh, really odd with the microphone behind your head, so apologies on the... So I'll try and do this without it crackling like it did for the lady there. Um, so in terms of, of space, so we actually have been monitoring how people have been travelling. As I said, we've been weighing people on trains. We have been, we've got manual passenger counts taking place um, over the last month or so. And the morning peak demand, as an example is for around 15,000 people um, pre-COVID. That was the level of people that travelled with 100% demand. Our current demand today is 7,000 people. And we've put in space for 16,000 people. So there's actually going to be, because of the introduction of the 707s on some of our routes, there will be more space than there was in December 19. So whilst frequency may have been impacted, the space and how we're deploying the trains has increased. That's for the morning peak. There is lots of space available for passengers and growth, and we will continue to monitor that. And as I said before, with the simpler nature, if that data tells us that more trains are needed, then we will be able to put them in in a uh, simpler way, affecting where they're needed. Um, yes, evening. Uh, it's uh, John Tidy from Transport for Charlton, formerly Charlton Row Users Group. Um, 
just want to return to the question of punctuality. Um, what gets measured gets done. And it's, it's our perception that the punctuality actually in the metro area isn't too bad mm -hmm. and that you're probably being driven by data that mostly applies to stations outside of the London area. So I'd like to ask for some statistics on that uh, with a breakdown on how, how those uh, punctuality numbers actually affect individual lines, individual areas, please. Um, a point that hasn't been brought up so far, causing people to change trains at uh, London Bridge, it may not be too congested at the moment, but as the demand goes up, you're going to have a lot of people traveling from one platform to another, and I am concerned that not only will people um, suffer incidents and accidents uh, on, the, uh, on the escalators and stairs, but also most, most certainly even on, on the narrow parts of the platform. Platform one is particularly narrow already, all the way along its length, but even the other ones have sections where people congregate because they want to get on a, at a particular, onto a particular carriage. I don't think you've thought this one through in th thoroughly, and I'd like to see some modeling done, if there has been any, uh, to prove that it actually will work okay without dangerous incident. Um, People have other, other people have mentioned about gaps in, uneven gaps in services. Um, you've said yourself that you've consulted with the disability groups. Um, that's great, but there are plenty of people, or there are some people who actually have mobility issues but are not registered disabled. Um, I myself had uh, several months using crutches. I was traveling up to Charing Cross. It was a lot better getting, getting on a direct train than it, was, than it would have been having to get off at London Bridge. Um, and struggle to use the escalators, the, 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 uh, the lifts, which is quite small capacity, let's admit, uh, and, and slow, and run the risk of actually having a, a, an accident as a result. Um, uh, thank you to both the Chair and uh, Councillor Williams for stealing some of my thunder on, on points, but um, just to pick up the point that, that Councillor Williams made about modal change, um, she talked about people going into central London. I think the issue is actually more the people who want to travel locally, Charlton, Lewisham, Blackheath, uh, Denmark. Uh, Denmark. Oh, you know, the, the, it's, again, it's the, and again, other, other councillors have refer, referred to it, it's the north-south connections that we're lacking. And the connection between Charlton uh, through Woolwich to Charlton and onto Lewisham and Blackheath, Blackheath and Lewisham is really, really key. Um, last point. As an organization, uh, Transport for Children has always supported the retention of the service with a rail operator rather than transferring it to TfL, um, primarily because um, it's always been our belief that transferring it to TfL would actually mean that we would lose this connecting link, this important connection between Charlton and other stations through to Charing Cross. If you're going to take it away, we don't see any point in, in supporting that, that position especially since TfL is likely to improve the punctuality and reliability than the service you can offer at the moment. Thank you. Okay. I'll start with the last one. I spent five years of my life at TfL. Um, so I know what it is. They, they um, are funded to provide first-to-last staffing. Uh, the um, London Overground has brand-new rolling stock, and their railway is geographically a lot simpler than the railway we're trying to run. So all of those good principles of metroization are transferable. Um, so you know, we need to build from, from, from this position, but they are transferable. The ownership of a railway, whether it's TfL with its, um, uh, with its skill set and its funding envelope, or whether it's Southeastern on behalf of the, uh, of the DFT, that shouldn't make a difference to you. We should be able to provide pay-as-you-go, secure railway, uh, good rolling stock, punctual service, irrespective of ownership. You know, I'm not here making a plea on behalf of shareholders. I'm here, you know, representing, you know, the public sector in exactly the same way that TfL are. But you made some, some very valid points. I'm going to ask Scott to pick up on some of them. Uh, if I deal with one of them about London Bridge being safe, I mean, there are 12 car Thameslink trains that pre-COVID were carrying over 12 
hundred people each arriving every few minutes on platforms four and five um, at, um, at London Bridge. And it's a railway that is, and a, and a station that is scoped for capacity. So we, and we turned it into a terminal station every time that there is a strike. So we manage the entire flow of the Southeastern Metro service on platforms two and three on every strike day. So we will, what is not negotiable is safety. We will ensure that this railway is safe and the interchanges at London Bridge are safe for you. I'm going to invite Scott to pick up on your points on, on for example, punctuality. Yeah, I, I think I would like just basically say that we will provide the data in terms of punctuality for Metro. We have that broken down by line of route. We also understand the influence that has on our own internal customer satisfaction surveys in terms of how that, if there's poor performance, the impact it has on customer satisfaction. So we're happy to share that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. we we'll break it down by line of route, station to station, so we can we, we can cut the data as as required. So some of the things we haven't shared this afternoon, but we a simplified timetable, for example, on the Hayes line, allows us to move rolling stock back and forth on the Hayes line all day. And then if there's a problem on the Hayes line, it won't contaminate the Sidcup line or the Bexley Heath line. So we are working to try and keep our rolling stock in fewer places so it doesn't go all across the southeastern metro. We're trying to free up places like Tunbridge Junction and Lewisham Junction. We've got a spare platform during the day at uh, one of our London termini, so if there is a problem with the train, we can park that there and still run the other trains in the frequencies that we assume. So we are doing a number of structural things that would be pr consistent with the principles of good railway operation. Thanks. Hi there, Ruth Dodson here, Charlton resident and also representing the Charlton Society as chair. Now, I am terribly concerned to be honest with you, I feel less happy now than I felt when I came in. I not, have not been reassured at all by anything that you guys have said. <laughs> you are not supporting those of us that commute up to town. Charing Cross is obviously very... I mean, I know, <laughs> you know Charing Cross is my end-of-line service. I don't understand why you are not allowing us to still use that. You know, I personally, and this is not down to me, many people I've spoken to, having that change, the awful long change through London Bridge, which is nasty, windy, difficult to navigate, particularly if you have any particular issues with mobility, why do we have to then go through that? why I live here. It was so easy to get up to town to Charing Cross. Thank you. I haven't actually asked the question yet, but I'm just saying I'm much more disappointed now than I was when I came into this meeting. You're not listening to people who commute regularly who need to get up to that particular part of town, and that is why we've chosen to live in this part of the world. Thank you. Um, Steve, was there anything you wanted to say to that, or should we go to the next question? Well, I do genuinely accept the point you make. I know if you have a regular journey, and I'm now asking you to change trains, you know, that's, that's a downside. I absolutely fully accept that. I have apologised for it. I recognise what you're saying. As we, will, we will reflect on the feedback you've given us, but I, I, tonight I can only describe to you why we have made the changes that we have made what we hope to achieve by those changes and be honest about the impact that it has, how we want to ensure that the changes at London Bridge are robust and are safe and are effective for you. But I acknowledge I'm asking you to change trains when today you don't have to do that. And for that, I'm sorry. Sorry, 
Um, <clears throat> just in the interest of time, um, I'm conscious there's a few councillors who do want to represent their residents, but I am going to ask members of the public, um, because they've come all this way, if there's any more questions from them first or any amenity groups, and then I'll come to the councillors. You have already spoken, haven't you? No, sorry. There's a hearing loop as well, so if you could use the microphone. Okay. So is it switched on? Um, yes, David Walker, the Blackheath Society. Obviously, we're on the Bexley Heath line, and clearly we are completely uh, horrified at the changes you've made. Um, it seems a little bit bizarre that you reckon you can get peak period trains from on the Bexley Heath line to Charing Cross, but not off-peak period trains, which seems somewhat odd that you would have thought there would be more trains on the network generally. Um, and oddly, it is actually the off-peak period that people want to get to Charing Cross. It, it, it's, you know, the off-peak and weekends. And going to Cannon Street is useless. And, of course, you've said we don't expect you to do that, but to have this change. And most people, and we, are completely opposed to that. Um, just as an aside, I think I believe I'm think, right in thinking that Heathrow can take planes landing every two minutes, and you can't seem to get trains through the Lewisham Junction in only less than two and a half minutes. So I appreciate, you know, they obviously have planes stacking, but two and a half minute intervals on a well-run railway, I wouldn't have thought was beyond the wit of your schedulers um, and other people that run the railway. A huge amount of money was put into that junction some years ago by Network Rail to improve its liability, reliability. And it just seems, you know, odd that after all that money that's put in, you're doing your best to actually have trains that just go straight through it and don't use the, the um, crossability that is built into that complicated junction. Um, my final point is that you talk a lot about getting um, feedback and how, in, how keen you are to hear what the public and people like us think. And yet we were, I was on your, net, your um, website this afternoon with somebody else and we could not find a single page where other than for things like fares or uh, specific things to your service, there was not a single page on the contact us section that enabled anybody to actually give any comment back, feedback on the general quality of the service as a whole. I think if you put that on, and please do, I think we should be able to feed back to you, and you would actually hear what people think on a continuing basis, and that would be very valuable for you to take that on board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've obviously got to make it more transparent, but on our website, there is a, a page that says this is the changes in December. There's a line by line of what it means for each route. And there's an FAQ that says, you know, give us your feedback by contacting the following. So we've got the team here. We'll take that away and just make sure it's very visible, um, just so that it's, it's much easier to find. But it is there. And we're not trying to hide it. We're trying to make it available. And lots of people are finding it um, on an hourly basis. But I do want to make it clear. Yeah, and we have that with our, with our customer relations team. If you tweet, we've got a quarter million followers on Twitter. We've got the website. We've got an app. If you contact us via customer relations, they then filter it out and arrange for a suitable response from the relevant department. So there's a single point of contact uh, available for everybody on every subject. On, on the question you asked about Lewisham Junction, uh, it is important that Lewisham Junction is reliable. There is investment being made. Uh, again, this Christmas, the railway is closed to allow further work. You know, it is a junction which, if it fails, it has a catastrophic impact on our railway. So we aren't trading this for a lack of investment in the infrastructure. You know, we need... 
the railway assets to work. We need the signalling to work. We need the track to work. We need trespassers to stay off the railway. We need to give you reliable trains. We need all of that as a package to give you a railway that you can rely upon every day. Um, but we're not, as I say, uh, failing to invest in the infrastructure. That there will actually be work done at Lewisham this Christmas. Uh, yes, John Webb from SE9 magazine. We organised the 12,000 name petition. Uh, it's a comment rather than a question. Uh, I didn't really appreciate all the flim flam about what people's priorities are. Uh, you say the highest priority is punctuality and reliability. For me, when I get on the train, is the highest priority is where it's going. And if I want to go to Charing Cross, I know not letting me do that. That is my highest priority, and I think that goes for most people. Thank you. Your first slide mentioned connectivity and the importance of rail to uh, the economy. So why the hell are you trashing the tourist trade and the leisure trade? By axing the charring cross trains, you're denying people access to the South Bank, Theatreland, Covent Garden, National Gallery, Buckingham Palace, Trafalgar Square, St. James's Park, ad infinitum. I've got tour guide and lecturer qualifications, so I do think I'm qualified to say something about this. Also, I noticed that earlier on, I believe there was some kind of idea of putting some trains on direct from Charing Cross very late at night to get people home after, say, they've been to the theatre. I looked on your timetable today. There is one train, 21 minutes past midnight. It will only operate on a Thursday and a Friday, and it has a little note on it that says also it's subject to cancellation through engineering works. Would you like to comment? Did you do any studies on this? And quite frankly, I can only echo the lady from Westcombe Park, or I'm sorry if I've made the wrong decision, I'm not sure who it was. I'm not convinced at all by your performance tonight. Thank you for coming to face us. It's very brave of you. But all I'm getting is, well, tough. Get on with it, because this is what we're going to do. I don't think you're listening at all. And the word that you keep using is, will reflect. And that says to me, absolutely nothing. You should be ashamed. So can I just respond? In terms of that late night service, can you just give me the details again? Because I want to look into that. So, and I would like to respond. Does everyone stay home watching Strictly on Saturdays? I don't. And I won't be using your services. <coughs> so a couple of things I would say on that. At the moment, our late-night trains fluctuate between Cannon Street and Charing Cross because of engineering work that rotates. It's quite an unusual circumstance. Yeah, but... Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I spent... Um, a number of you don't appreciate it. Uh, you might appreciate it. You might hear what we're saying. You're going to do sweet FA about it. No, no, I think the point has been well made in, by many of you this evening that Charing Cross, for many of you, is a much more attractive destination than Ooh. Cannon Street. I accept that completely. If I was in the room with people on the Hayes Line, they no longer have a service to Cannon Street. We have not made a choice that Cannon Street is a better destination for you. We've just tried to simplify the railway, but I do appreciate that now requires a change, which you didn't need to do. And there is definitely ben a benefit in able to go directly to Waterloo East and to Charing Cross. I fully, fully accept that. I can't sit here today and say it will change a week on Tuesday, because it won't. We're trying to be honest with you why we changed it. Um, and, and what we try to achieve through that change. But we will reflect on what you've said and what other user groups will tell us and, and consider what we can do in the future. You've made your points very well tonight. Um, may I make the case for... Um...
I'm very sorry. Um, I know a number of children who go to school at Waterloo. They travel from points south. Waterloo is also the um, site of St. Thomas's Hospital where you get very sick people. And I get, I think you've got a very naive and rosy picture of what um, can be achieved uh, in exchanging passengers at uh, London Bridge. And I know um, sort of cancer patients who rely upon a straight through service and they're going to be put from hell to breakfast. And all I can say is, um, don't try cancer, it ain't funny, it ain't nice. And what you're doing to people like that, and there are plenty of them from this neck of the woods, is sick. And I think you're very naive if you think we're going to swallow some of the corporate flannel we've heard tonight. What you've come and given us is a fait accompli. And what you're really saying is this is what you're going to get. Get used to it. No one here wants to make life harder for people with cancer. Every, every single person in this room has you know, had personal experience of, of difficulties. We, we know there are big hospitals across our network. Uh, some of the services that we've put in have been designed to protect hospital flows. Um, as I said, we take very seriously the feedback you're giving us. If somebody needs to, as having cancer treatment at Waterloo, and we'll find this problematic. You know, let us know. We'll do everything we can. We are not doing this out of any malice. We're doing this to try and, 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 and in the long term, make this railway better. But your, you know, your point is well made. But honestly, we would, that would be the last thing that we would want to happen. Thank you. Can I just see a very quick show of hands of who still wants to speak? Who isn't a councillor, first of all? Can we have that lady, and then can we quickly go around the councillors who want to speak straight after the other, and then Steve, Scott, and Alex can reply to them all at once. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is going to be quick, and it's just to engage a little bit of hope, maybe, out of this horrendous meeting tonight. Um, I represent the Irish community here in South East London, and we actually do a lot of work in Greenwich, a lot of work in Bexley, a lot of work in Lewisham. The changes are going to affect people who can access our groups because normally they come on off-peak trains. Um, and we've actually been spending a lot of time this year trying to encourage people back onto trains. And now you've, with pardon the pun, derailed all of that because you are once again making them feel isolated. They're going to stay at home. They're not going to make the journeys out. And to second the points that have already been made here tonight, you know, trains coming back from Charing Cross at 20 past 12 at night is not something that I can encourage people to actively go to a show. We might get free tickets, we might access the arts, we might want to take them places, go on walking tours, and they're just not going to do that. Now, the question I want to ask is, what's the criteria we need to meet for you to make a change? What will it take? How many signatures do we need to get? What's going to, what's going to really genuinely initiate a change for you guys in the next six months? Um, I think that's an excellent question, and can we have the response to that before we go to the councillors? Thank you. Every railway needs to balance the needs of all its customers and all its stakeholders. So if you tell us the key issues we need to deal with and the consequences of the current timetable and the number of people that we're affecting, you know, that's the insight that we can use. Uh, the risk of quoting somebody else. We're trying to create a, a railway for the many, not the few. So I want you to tell us where the biggest problems are and the times of the day and the hours of the day. So for example, I, I explained to you that we had also simplified the junction at um, Paddock Wood and Tunbridge as well as Lewisham. That's a different discussion with a different audience on a different night. But in that, we did run a couple of trains over the junction, which were for school trains, which we knew had several hundred children on a particular train in the morning, and we forced it through the junction and we made that work. So if we, so we will, as I say, 
we want this feedback. We'll make it very clear how you tell us. Just contact our customer relations, you know, market timetable, and it will come to us. So tell us the key issues that you have. If you say no one in London wants to change trains at London Bridge, I can't do much with that. Or I need seven days a week, 24 hours a day, direct trains. I can't do much with that. But if you give me some specific issues, like the lady with the hospital or your theatres, you know, it's easier for us to respond to that significant and specific information. And we're here, you know, we're here for the long run. We're part of the public sector now. If you have one of these in six months' time, it's still us. If you have one of these in a year's time, it's still us. We want to... We want to make this railway the best that we can make it, so we want, that, we want that feedback. But help with granular, specific, and sizable information. Um, can I just add that on several occasions, as we've done the previous sort of 15 timetables, we got lots of things wrong because they were done in a hurry. Uh, I mean, a real like a couple of weeks responding to government guidance. We frequently, and have a record of adapting based on feedback, things like school trains, some of the first trains for um, you know, hospital workers, uh, late trains, etc. So please, please give us the specifics because we can, on some occasions, we'll be able to do things. And some of those we can make sooner than, if they're not huge structural changes, some of those things may be able to be adapted quite quickly. So please let us know. Right, moving on to the councillors. Um, if you guys could speak one after the other, keep it brief and try not to repeat any points that we've already had, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, I'm Councillor Simon Pearce, Councillor for uh, Elton Park and Progress Board. Um, I think some of the, the points I was going to make have been made quite well by others, but the, a few things I had around the reliability and or the kind of rationale that you had behind the... Uh, the timetable change, I think as others have said, it misses the point really of um, also the purpose of the service is to get people where they want to go as well as uh, the punctuality side. Um, my particular concern is that uh, a lot of kind of stock has been and made around the Elizabeth line and, and DLR and uh, my residence in Elton Park Progress, we, we have very, very limited access to, to that service, right? We, we've got buses that can connect us to Woolwich, but it's, it's quite a long um, journey. And, and I think it, there's a kind of, your points around other termini, only, or only other services only having the one termini. I mean, South East London is particularly, you know, it's historically poorly served by TfL services. So I think, I, I'm not sure that, that argument really washes with me. Um, you know, we are quite unique in London. You look at the and there's a great big gaping hole in the South East. Um, so, you know, the, the, these services to Charing Cross, it, it, particularly sort of as uh, the lady in front of me has mentioned about late night services, about, um, you know, people going out in the evening using central London as it, as it should be used. Um, those are gone for my residents now. Charing Cross, some of the fifth line, and, and those opportunities for a, a quick journey to Altima are gone. Um, finally, about just, just about, I know colleagues want to speak as well, but in terms of accessibility, I mean, London Bridge is huge. And I, I can see it will be exhausting for customers with, with mobility issues to get around there. And others have mentioned about the free, you know, when, when it starts to get busy. Um, I remember, you know, I've travelled on South Eastern for 30 years now. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I think I've got three questions. <coughs> One, uh, what's your response to the petition? I think we should number 12,000 people. And as a consequence of the discussions this evening, can you give an assurance that you consult widely uh, in advance of the May timetable? Uh, because I think that will give people an opportunity to build confidence in what you're saying. I don't think this evening we've got that message very clear. The second point I want to make do you not think it's extremely good practice uh, from a business point of view 
rather than cutting services to incentivise people to travel more uh, on the railways uh, and therefore maximise opportunities and save the planet as a, uh, as a consequence. And the final point I want to make, um, <clears throat> I don't buy the comment you were making with regard to the savings um, that you suggested were minimal. Uh, I'd like to ask you a direct question. What are the savings uh, that uh, will happen as a consequence of the reduction on the Black Heat Line? Thanks. Hello, Richard Tuckett Ryan, Councillor for Middle Park and Horn Park. My question is, you answered about population growth. Um, however, we have, and so it was very difficult to be able to predict future housing needs along the line, but we have housing development that is currently on track, particularly, say, uh, in Kidbrook Village, uh, where we have, you know, several thousand more homes already being built, predicated on the fact that people will be able to access trains frequently from Kidbrook Station, which isn't a transport hub, it is only a station. So my question is, what specific uh, metrics have you used around developments that we know are already beyond in development or in the pipeline? So... so um, one more. Uh, Odette McGahey, uh, also councillor for Kidbrook Park. Um, I'm pleased that you've taken on board what people have said about Charing Cross and Waterloo East. Uh, one of the things that concerned me was no one seems to have looked at the volume of usage of the different termini because I've used the Bexley Heath line regularly and the Greenwich line regularly and it always seems to be about two to one. That is one person going to Cannes Street for every two that are going to Charing Cross or Ward Louise. So to take those services out is going to affect most people or more people. Um, and there's no point in having capacity to put more trains on if they're not going to the right place. Um, uh, I'm glad that uh, Simon brought up about the tube map because I think that's the big difference here in the southeast that uh, for geological reasons and reasons of wealth, this part of London hasn't been developed like the rest of the London. So we are more reliant on those crossing services. Um, and I'm a bit concerned that once you've developed your service around the junction being limited in use, that it will then be harder to introduce even small changes if the junction is effectively becoming a straight line of track like shown in the diagram. And one last thing, um, although there are people that need assistance and there are people that don't need assistance, there's a lot of people on the spectrum in between and 15 minutes of an arduous platform change every single day I feel exhausted just thinking about it. And I think there's just one more councillor, Councillor Backen. Hello, hi, Sammy Backen, councillor for Elton, Elton Town in Avery Hill. Um, I'm also a nurse and I really, really, I work at St Thomas's Hospital and um, I've worked there for five years and I've seen hundreds and hundreds, thousands of patients in clinic and I always make small talk with them. How did you get here today? These are unwell patients and they often say, they come on the SIG cut, the Bexley Heath line, the, the other lines, and they say, well, at least the train was direct. But they won't be able to say that anymore. These patients will now have to tackle a really, uh, as has already been mentioned, an arduous change at London Bridge. And this will rob these patients of their independence. They can just about do a direct train, but they can't do a change at London Bridge. It will force them to be driven by their relatives or themselves, further increasing, increasing car use. I really, really urge you to rethink these changes for these patients. Thank you. And that's it, um, if you guys would like to wrap up with answering those points, thank you. Sorry, it's unusual to get sort of half a dozen questions in one go. Let's, um, 
Let's start with the petition. We take the petition very seriously. We take every individual letter we get very seriously. We take the case studies of things like taking people to St. Thomas's Hospital. So we will use, as I said before, we will use all of that feedback. We haven't made these changes lightly, and we've not here come here with an attitude that things will not change in the future. So we will, we will use everything we get from this uh, and other um, stakeholders to look at what we can do in May and indeed prior to May. I've given you that commitment tonight. It's a sincere commitment uh, within the bounds of the capabilities that we have, but it is a sincere commitment to understand and to improve where we can. We have a track record. We've changed our timetable 15 times during COVID. It got smaller, 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 bigger, 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 smaller, 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 and up again. We will, we will make changes. This is not the end state. This is the next timetable, and you have our commitment uh, to take all of that feedback on. And whether it's one case study or a 12,000 name petition or a, um, uh, a feedback from a particular market, you know, the, the bigger you can make it and the more granular can, you can make it, the better. Just give us that feedback, and we will, we're, we're starting to look at it already. Yeah, in, I mean, in terms of savings, the truth is this railway costs £6.2 million a week to run. There aren't any savings because inflation is 10%, and I don't have savings on a line-by-line -line, uh, basis. Overall, the southeastern timetable in December will be similar to the timetable that we run today. Not in your part of the world, but overall. Uh, we run fewer... We are running fewer vehicle miles... We are trying to keep um, control of the rolling stock costs that we have. We're looking at other opportunities to save money. But, you know, we haven't done this to save specific costs on the, you know, on the Bexley Heath line, which I think was the question that was asked. If, um, if I can pick up around the housing developments, um, in terms of interaction we know that some of this information goes with colleagues from network rail but there is a varied amount of it sometimes it's really really good sometimes it's not so good so please give us that feedback go onto the website use the information and provide us with that because that intelligence helps us shape plans for the future you know we want to make if you look at the stuff that was shown earlier we're cre trying to create space for people so that the railway can grow and attract more people back to it that space is a requirement. So having intelligence around where we are going to get more housing, as we've said earlier, though, more houses doesn't automatically now mean more travel on the railway. People have lots of choices. So please let us know because we want to factor that in. In terms, in terms of the split of services between um, Bexley Heath and the Woolwich Line, the you're you're broadly right. There were two. It's about twice as many people on the Bexley Heath line that go through to Charing Cross than they are on the Woolwich line. So our, our figures support exactly what you've said. That is one of the reasons why the Bexley Heath service in the peak goes through to Charing Cross, so that we we've ha we've uh, minimised the amount of interchange, so there's not two different flows interchanging at the same time. Um, on that, I'll have to take that away. I know quite a lot about the service and the plans, but not the loadings of every train and every route and timings. But I will take that away and give a response post-meeting. I think the question that I don't think we've answered is what are we doing to incentivise travel? You know, earlier this year there was the Great British Rail sale. We sold 750,000 uh, tickets at half price. So we are doing things where we're, where we're able to do so. But because we're now part of the public sector, we, you won't, you'll see marketing campaigns for Southeastern, for those running at the moment. You'll see increasingly marketing campaigns aimed at commuters to come back as opposed to leisure, which is uh, to a large extent already there. And whenever we get the opportunity to join in a national uh, sale, we will willingly uh, embrace that. We want 
travel to be affordable. We do understand the cost of living crisis uh, and it is important that uh, our railway remains accessible um, to those um, who, who need to use it. There was one other question, there was another question around, uh, sorry, there was one other question around services and direct services to hospitals. So we'll take that. One of the things that we said we were here to listen, so we'll take that away. We'll try and look at specific numbers, understand what we can do. Okay, um, thank you all so much um, for being here. I appreciate that you've had three hours of questioning from us, um, and we do appreciate that you've come down here and that you've listened and responded. Um, I think you can, one of the overwhelming takeaways is how important that need to consult really was. Um, and the, the gentleman back there did mention how difficult it is to give feedback on the website, and I really hope that you do take away looking at a, a better way to give feedback, particularly on timetable changing, so you're not just getting random customer service agents copying and pasting a response about timetable changes. I think having yeah, a... Can I be clear? That's not the case. We have a customer relations team who are passionate, and they top every industry lead table at the speed of their response on customer relations issues. If you email customer service, there are now two hand-picked individuals that are responding to every one of these questions because they are specific, they are detailed, and they are timetable related. So we've got one address for you to contact us, but behind the scenes we've got a dedicated team that are just focusing on the issues of the timetable because we do appreciate how important they are. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank, I really do thank you all for coming. It's really appreciate that you're coming down here, um, especially coming down here yourself, Steve and Scott and Alex and the rest of the Southeastern team. Um, it has been really helpful. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying past half nine. Thank you for all your questions. We, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss it with you and we are listening. Thank you. We're just saying we heard you commit to come back in six months. <laughs>
boundary, which runs around the north and south circular. We received around 52,000 responses to that consultation and expect a mayoral decision in the next 30 days um, with a view to, to provide more clearer clarity on what will happen as far as the next stage and when that will go ahead. Currently, plans are in place for the expansion of the, the ultra-low emission zone in summer 2023. Um, and, and, and obviously, we'll wait for that particular decision. At this stage, it's still with the mayor for his strategic decision and, and choice. Keeping it nice and quick. Um, updating on the Elizabeth line, you may be aware that uh, on Monday the 24th, we will be finally opening Bond Street, which will take our complement of step three and fully accessible stations across the Elizabeth Line network. Um, we're currently in the final stage of testing at this stage um, and expect that the station will be able to accommodate around 140,000 extra passenger journeys per day. Um, and obviously will link quite nicely into the central London shopping district and enable customers traveling in from uh, the Abbey Wood and Woolwich area in around 26 minutes. Uh, the, oh, I realize there's a second part to that slide. Um, in addition to that, we're uh, preparing for the um, next phase of the delivery of the Elizabeth Line, which will see an integration of services. So um, passengers traveling in from Abbey Wood and um, Woolwich will be able to, to connect all the way through without changing to Reading and to Heathrow. Um, that's obviously a fundamental part of our next stage. That's kicked off on the 6th of November um, and, and obviously is a massive enhancement to our wider Elizabeth, uh, transport network in the area. Uh, as part of this particular phase of the work, uh, we expect frequency between Paddington and Whitechapel to increase to 16 trains an hour and uh, in off-peak period and 22 trains an hour during the peak period of the day uh, and that's Monday to Friday. Apologies for running quite quickly through these. Um, I just also wanted to provide an update on our Vision Zero strategy. As you're probably aware, uh, the Mayor's strategy at this uh, on this topic is to eradicate the occurrence of, of deaths and serious injuries on roads by 2041. Last year, uh, 75 people sadly lost their lives on London roads and 3,500 were seriously injured across London. Um, in Greenwich specifically, that was 96 serious injuries and two fatalities. Uh, and as you can see from analysis so far this year, sadly that has projectively gone uh, increased. We've seen five fatalities year to date um, and 22, uh, sorry, 21 serious injuries. Um, what we're pleased to announce as part of this is we're releasing a, a dashboard that's available to the public and available to yourselves uh, so you can undertake analysis locally and get a more granular overview of, of what's going on and activities across the borough and obviously th those, those key focuses on, on things like um, sort of modal impact, um, uh, injuries, and indeed fatalities. If it's okay, I'll, I'll jump straight on to our Silvertown update. So as you're aware, we started tunneling on the Silvertown from the Newham side, Silvertown area. We've so far reached 50.5 metres uh, and still have over 2,000 metres um, remaining as part of that tunnelling. The, the, as far as tunnel rings are concerned, they're the structural frame that keeps the tunnel in shape. Um, we've so far installed 18 rings, um, and that will obviously continue over the next months. We expect the boring machine to arrive in Greenwich towards the end of this year, early next, um, 
and we'll be able to turn that round and move that back in the opposite direction to complete the second part of the tunneling phase. Um, the rotation chamber, as it's called, is, is actually already prepared, um, and we're ready to do that once it arrives. I think it takes a couple of days for it to be fully turned round and put in place. Um, as far as um, concrete pours have begun on the permanent uh, portal building, and piling is completed on one side of the new footbridge. Um, you'd be aware as well, structurally, we've um, built, a, or, or Riverlinks have built a car park um, close to the O2 Arena, and that's not yet, although I know that says that it's uh, handed over to the operator, it's near to be handed over. Uh, on the 13th of October, we released our air quality monitoring report. That's the first report that has been done in the area and across London uh, in some years. This allows us to set a, a good benchmark for future um, air quality analysis. Um, we'll continue to do that over the next few years and once the, the delivery of the Silvertown Tunnel project has gone into place, we'll continue that commitment to monitoring air quality in the borough and around the area of the tunnel for a further three years as a base minimum. Um, I just wanted to highlight some exceedances that were recorded as part of our recent analysis. This report has been sent out to councillors and I believe it's been sent out to yourselves as well for, for review. Um, there was one incident in, in Blackheath Hill um, which reached um, 42 um, micrograms of air pollution. I move on now to the A102 works which were started on the 17th of October. These works form a fundamental part of the delivery of the Silvertown Tunnel and um, help to support the realignment of the road along the Blackwall Tunnel south southern approach into the new tunnel gateway. That work started uh, but with two weeks of focused works um, which have removed capacity to the north and southbound road between Brood Street and Blackwall Lane. Um, that work will continue until the 31st of October and we will then move on to the second phase of those works which will impact the south southbound lane and reduce that permanently from three lanes to two and will impact the slip road going off to Blackwall Lane. Those works will continue through until summer 2023. I just wanted to highlight as well um, some of the advanced messaging that we've put in place across the, the, the borough network, um, included with some vehicle messaging locally to give drivers advanced notification of the works uh, and where possible to help steer their journeys as appropriate. Um, in addition to that work, we've communicated with around 2 million TfL registered customers to give them advance notice of the work, worked with the freight, taxi private hire, and other related forums that obviously use the Blackwall Tunnel predominantly and hope that we can minimize the impact that have occurred. We've also, as part of our communications plan, communicated with all ward councillors across the Greenwich Borough. I also want to just highlight some, a piece of work that's coming as part of the Silvertown program. This is our bus service consultation. Um, one of the commitments as part of the delivery of the Silvertown Tunnel is the implementation of a 20 bus per hour um, bus network running through both Blackwall and Silvertown. Um, this is an initial proposal that we'll start to consult on from the 16th of November. Brings two new routes to the line in addition to the currently running 108. That service, the 108 as it stands, currently runs Lewisham to Stratford and will go through the Blackwall Tunnel. Those new services, the, one, the 129, were operating from Lewisham to Great Eastern Quay via the Silvertown Tunnel and the X239 uh, running from Grove Park with a fast service um, operating up to, um, double check where that, 
fast bid is. Uh, it will be a non-stop running service from uh, between Sun in the Sands, Roundabouts, and Lima Roundabouts, um, and operate all the way up to, to Canary Wharf via the Silvertown Tunnel. What I've done here is just modelled out some of those connections, so you've got a sense of the connectivity that this offers, and obviously an expansion on the pre-existing bus network. And that is my very short and brief update. Thanks very much. Um, my first question is on Silvertown Tunnel, um, in particular traffic and air quality. So um, you mentioned air quality monitoring um, there, and in answer to written question five, um, I think the first sentence was, the Silvertown Tunnel will improve local traffic conditions and deliver an improvement in air quality. Um, and that raised quite a lot of questions for me. So first of all, with traffic conditions, I don't quite understand how, because if Silvertown increases the river crossing capacity from two to four lanes, but all the southbound traffic will then feed into the A102, which already has gridlock traffic, and then it reduces further at Kidbrook, you're sort of increasing road crossing capacity, but into Greenwich, you're not, sorry, it's late. Into Greenwich, you're not increasing the capacity there. So to my mind, that's just gonna make traffic worse for residents in our borough. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I'm, I'm, I'm by no means the expert on this project and my colleagues who, who would have otherwise been here will be able to answer this with a more sort of thorough information. I mean, the, the, the purpose of the, the tunnel is obviously to, to change and change that dynamic burden in the area and in an effort to keep traffic flowing um, across London. We, we obviously need to increase capacity, which is a, a true reality of the fact that the, the, the Blackwall Tunnel is, is fundamentally the only crossing within the Greater London boundary on the east side of, the, of London. Um, as far as air quality is concerned, I can't comment particularly on that, and I can certainly come back to you on, on any specific questions. Um, but it's, you know, the, the, the project is one that, that, that certainly we anticipate will, will holistically provide better quality of uh, sort of air quality by increasing and flowing traffic. Okay, I um, appreciate you're, so, not, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you're not an air quality expert. What I would like you to, to take away and come back with a response on um, is, so the air, from, from, and I'm also not an air quality expert, yeah. but from what I understand, what you're measuring is, is nitrous oxide, mm -hmm. but there's been a lot of studies recently and, in, and some World Health Organization guidance that suggests um, PM 2.5 might be more relevant. And so I'd like to ask TfL to consider monitoring levels of, of, of that rather than just the nitrous oxide. And uh, I appreciate you're not the expert, so if you can yeah. take that away and come back. I'll, I'll certainly take it away. I, I, I do know that it's not part of the DCO, which is the, the framework around the program, um, but I'll certainly pass that back to the project team for, on, on your behalf. Thank you. Moving on to something you might, um, that might be more your area is the Elizabeth Line. Um, so you'll have heard tonight uh, that the Elizabeth Line is great for people living north of the borough, but for those in the south of the borough, so in my ward, Elton Town and Avery Hill, there's very poor connectivity to the Elizabeth Line, and it basically means we're unable to use it. Um, please, can you explore increasing buses to the Elizabeth Line stations? And if you're not doing that, why aren't you doing it? Um, we continuously look at the bus network um, and look for efficiencies. Obviously, at the moment, the Elizabeth Line is shiny and new. Um, and we're still in that process of understanding the, the change in travel patterns and, and, and habits and how that's affecting the wider bus network. Uh, there is, of course, opportunity for us to, to look at individual opportunities to, to change routes where necessary um, or indeed where capacity demand is, is needed, then we obviously can look at that. So. But I think if you're looking at how the network's currently used, you won't yes. see the huge gaping gap that there is between, for people it, who want to use the Elizabeth Line. Indeed. With specific instances, I can certainly take that back into the team and we can look at specific routes. Um, but, but as far as a, a sort of a, a wider holistic, that's something which is an ambition in the future. 
Okay. Um, and my final question before I hand over to the panel. Um, so Greenwich, obviously, it's a World Heritage Site, and we have a lot of tourism. And hopefully with the end of the pandemic, more and more tourists will come back into Greenwich. And they often arrive at the Cutty Stark DLR station, um, where escalators have been a problem for a really long time. And in your written response to question 10, you've given an updated timeline for fixing the issue. But one of the escalators is still not due to be fixed until August 2023. And so why does the timeline keep being pushed out? Because that was supposed to be fixed this summer. And it, it just feels like we're being a bit neglected down here. No, I can assure you that's not the case. Um, I'll, I'll certainly take it back and speak to the guys over at Coley who operate the DLR um, and get you a personal response as to sort of what's happening when that escalator. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, a very quick question on the ULES. I've asked this in our recent highways committee meeting and our officers didn't have the answer. So I wondered if you might know if you have any figures on the reduction of traffic within our bit of the ULES um, and the actual direct impact on number of journeys that it has had uh, on our, our portion and whether that will be taken into account when it comes to the thinking around the extension. Also, will the cost of living crisis be taken into account when the, I appreciate you cannot comment on behalf of the Mayor of London, but um, some reassurances that you will take this back and ask that the cost of living crisis will be taken into account when the consultation responses are considered, I think would be very grateful. Um, and while, no, I'll, I'll save that. So, I mean, the first part, I, I equally don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, as far as the decision making, you know, I, I can't answer on behalf of the Mayor, but, but I, I do know that they are considering all factors at the GLA around the cost of living and other impacts. Um, but we truly don't know what that decision will look like at this stage and, and hope to, sort of win. we're not that far away, hopefully, from understanding what the decision will be. Councillor Selden. Hi, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, I've got two questions. One is around, again, the ULES. And the expansion of that, obviously with the intention of that is also to reduce the number, not just the pollution, but the number of car journeys made. Uh, what steps are being taken to investigate increasing uh, bus transport density in the new ULES areas? Because that's an area where it's particularly poorly served. We're seeing it moving into it as far as Sparrow is concerned. Indeed. Uh, I, th I think tackling air quality is one that sort of requires... Um, multi strands of thinking. It's not going to be a silver bullet that will we'll deal with it. The reality is, is um, in order to, to meet our carbon um, reduction targets, I believe there is a, a need for a 30% reduction in traffic across London. Um, and, and that will come by looking at the bus network, looking particularly at um, things like bus priority and, and ensuring that what we're able to put out there on the bus network is operating as efficiently as possible. Um, we're obviously continuing to work with colleagues at Greenwich to look at opportunities to expand on bus priority. And that, coupled with things like road user charging, will obviously help to, to enable um, that, that reduction in, in tra car usage. Great, thank you. Uh, my second question <coughs> was around Vision Zero and the quite frankly astonishing results that we seem to have in 2022. So if I take a look at the 2019 to 2021 figures and I disregard the actual fatality, seriousness or slight injuries, because um, essentially the difference between those is, is luck to a degree. Um, if I were to take an average of those three years, the total figures are around 10% variance either side of that. However, in 2022, we seem to have achieved a sort of remarkable, a truly remarkable reduction. And I was just wondering what that might be attributable to. I would like to say it's improved road safety. Uh, it could be anything at the moment. Uh, I mean, do bear in mind that that data has a lag um, probably of around three or four months on that. So um, at this stage, it's difficult to sort of give an indication as to what that is. You know, we, we work quite closely with... Um, sort of just looking at the proportion of, of, of injuries 
it will, you know, we work with schools, obviously, to improve road safety. Um, the formation of, of an increased number of um, cycle, safe cycle highways um, will obviously help to, to, to help sort of deliver some of those reduction in, in, in injuries that in, involve cyclists and, and cars. Um, but I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer specifically as to what, what is contributing to that factor. Yeah, I mean, even taking the lag into account, and if I were to quadruple the 2022 <laughs> figures, it's quite a remarkable achievement. So no. uh, if you could get back to us, because it would be really useful to know what we're doing right so we can do more of it. No, definitely, definitely. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Rob. Uh, I've got three quick questions. The first is on the ULES. Um, just a practical question, really. Will we get a borough breakdown of the consultation responses? Will we have the figures of um, how many were opposed and supportive in Greenwich? So the report itself is currently being uh, written at the moment. I don't know how granularly they look at the analysis because uh, from a sort of borough by borough because th there isn't an obligation, I don't believe, to, to put sort of postcodes into the, into the responses. People can do it anonymously. Um, of course, so that sort of does skew some of the data. Um, as far as res responding to um, specific issues, including the borough's response to the, the ULES proposals, again, we respond overall to, to all responses that we receive, so it probably explains why it's taking quite a time to put that report together. Okay, thank you. Um, second question is on, uh, just to follow up really, uh, on the Chair's uh, 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 good point about again, which you've heard a lot tonight about north-south mm -hmm. transport links and the lack of. Um, and in particular, um, you've heard this new southeastern timetable has taken away this half-hourly loop service from the Sigup line to the Woolwich line. And that, to uh, uh, my mind, makes an even stronger argument for the X161 uh, route, which we've previously proposed. Mm -hmm. So Chiselhurst to Woolwich service, Chiselhurst, Mottingham, Eltham, yep. a wiggle through the hospital and Woolwich. An express version of the 161 would would go a mm. long way, actually, to, to addressing that uh, that kind of uh, barrier to accessing the benefits of the Elizabeth Line sure. in the south of the borough. Um, I asked previously, and it's a flat no, and it's been a flat no for very many years. So, so I, funnily I, enough, had a further conversation on on this particular matter today. I mean, I, I want to answer this in two parts. One around an express service. There's uh, whilst sort of offering an express service in theory offers um, journey time improvement, that's not a guarantee, sadly, and that's linked to um, traffic density, of course. Um, you know, stopping for each bus stop obviously will, will give you an incremental amount of improvement to journey time, but actually if it's busy and we're looking at a road which is chock-a-block, it's not going to actually change anything um, on the route itself. As far as Looking at a, a sort of a considering um, an, a, a sort of a 161 or an X161, um, we'd happily look at that. Um, it's something that's, not, you know, uh, as I was told earlier, you know, never say no, um, and you know, I, you know, we'll happily look at it further down the line. Obviously, we'd need to look at the impact of the changes to the southeastern services yeah, and, and I think, see uh, whether that shifts a demand elsewhere and if that does and we have evidence to do that and the modelling that supports that then we can certainly look at opportunities to, to alternate that. I mean it, it's a challenge because obviously it comes with a cost um, we have to put in um, a new contract to deliver a specific additional service and that comes with a bus capacity in the fleet as well that needs to be reviewed as well. So it's, it's certainly something we can consider and look at perhaps sometime, sometime in the future. Oh, you've cheered me right up. Thank you. After, after the flat no in the right written response. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the, uh, yeah, you're right. It's really that southeastern change which I think tips mm. the argument even further in favour of, of the idea. So thank you for, for uh, that commitment. Final quick question is on junctions. My ward is Mottingham, Cold Avenue, Eltham. We've got two uh, very busy, uh, problematic junctions, the Five Ways Junction and the Court Road A20 Junction. Um, of all my casework, 
like, yes. I can't describe the number of uh, I, I can proportion uh, that are, relate to the five, way, five ways and court road junctions. Um, the, uh, in here, you've uh, agreed to add the court road jun A20 junction to the signalling timing review, which is really great news. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. Um, on five ways, there's, um, there's kind of mixed, mixed uh, kind of messaging from TfL. Um, lots of residents feel there should be a right filter um, yes. going into New Elton when you're London bound. Mm -hmm. um, previously, TfL have said no, there's been petitions and that kind of thing. And um, there's a much more positive response here, which is great. Um, could, we, could you basically just help me set up a ward councillor's uh, site visit so we can get the right people from TfL in the room? Because I think quite often we've been talking at cross purposes with TfL. So if I could enlist your help in, in yes, getting certainly. to the bottom of that one, that would be great. We have a new sponsor in place, and I'll certainly work with, with Ryan to, to put together something. Has he not buggered off? No, he's still there. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Rob. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the survivor, 1050. We're still going. Yeah, we're still going. Okay. Um, Woolwich Ferry um, didn't su uh, submit any questions in advance. Um, sorry. Mm. Uh, but um, the service is abysmal. Shiny new ferries, the service is abysmal. Is there anything that can be done about it? It's, it's, it's unpredictable. It doesn't go. You get there when there's supposed to be a two ferry service and it's a one ferry service. You get there when there's a one ferry service and there's no service. What's being done about the Woolwich Ferry? Yes. <laughs> um, it's been fraught with some problems recently, um, and we acknowledge that. It's um, the, the two issues, unfortunately, with the Woolwich Ferry. One is a technical issue um, with some of the repairs on, on, the, on, the, on the ferry itself um, and difficulties in being able to get parts to to complete those repairs. The other part of the issue is around resourcing, unfortunately, um, and the lack of staff that we currently have available to operate a two ferry service. Um, that is currently being addressed by those, now that TfL operates the service itself. Um, we're currently recruiting, as I understand, um, and it's, I, I don't know how long it takes for training, so I'm gonna pass on that particular side of when that will be addressed, but I, I can assure you that it's, it's in hand. Good to know it's on the radar. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and whisk through these. I know this is um, a bit random, but and I know the Silvertown Tunnel is, you know, 50 metres in. Um, is it too late to take the spoil out by river? Because I've asked this question several times of, of various um, people, and they said no. So instead of juggernauts going through Blackheath or whatever, there's a river. Can you not put a pontoon there and just ship it out? Is it too late? Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Okay, I uh, just thought it was worth an ask. Um, right, buses. I know the situation at the moment and if you're asking for new buses or it's, it's, it's kind of, I, I know what the situation is at the moment. However, uh, my water plums to common you can't get a bus along the Plumster Common Road, and I'm not expecting you to know Plumster Common Road, without going down through Woolwich. Um, you can't get a bus to Abbey Wood. It's, you know, it's got buses to Woolwich, which is great for transport connections, but actually a lot of people just want to get along the Plumster Common Road and get to the hospital without going via Woolwich. So I don't know if there's any um, scope looking at that in the future? It's a similar answer to the last one on the 161. It's, you know, we obviously have financial challenges at the moment. TfL have recently been um, given a, a, a revised financial package by Her Majesty's Government, or His Majesty's Government, shall I say. Um, it's, we obviously look at the bus network regularly to try and look at opportunities, um, and it's certainly one that we can look at um, separately and I can talk to them but again we we're faced with um, identifying that opportunity and demand looking at modeling and then obviously the, the final piece of the puzzle is is finances um, uh, I think the last time I looked at numbers it was something like half a million pound to deliver a new bus route um, and sort of that budget has to come from somewhere unfortunately and often comes from efficiencies elsewhere 
So it's, it's important that if we do look at something like that, that we're providing a holistic improvement to the service um, regionally and across the borough. Um, uh, and making sure we achieve those primary objectives. So it's something we can certainly look at. Again, it's another case of never say never. Um, and probably when we do get to that point where we can look at Greenwich bus services holistically, we can put that into the pot and, and have a look. I can't say a guaranteed yes, we'll do it, but I, I won't take it off the table for you. Well, thanks so much. And I know there's big calls from, I think, most councillors for better bus connectivity, north-south borough, so you can get from Eltham quite easily to the north of the borough. It doesn't really exist. Um, <clears throat> on buses, again, uh, the 180 bus, um, which was, has now been diverted to go to North Greenwich, used to go all the way through to Lewisham. Now, I remember this first consultation, so it was before the current funding issues uh, faced by TfL. Um, and that consultation was something like 2017, maybe even 2016. And um, now it goes to North Greenwich. There's, you could get to Lewisham. Um, you know, it sort of runs all the way through the constituency of Erith and Thamesmead and then through Greenwich and Woolwich and gets you to Lewisham for £1.65. And then having to get on the, well, before having to get on the train is more expensive, but I, not anymore. But, um, How's that working out? The logic of, of taking the 180, which was the only sort of bus from the east of this borough, there's only two buses from the east of this borough to Greenwich, um, to get, and now there's only one. Um, how's that working out? And what was the rationale? Because the rationale that was given was it's to provide more connectivity with the Elizabeth line, but it goes to North Greenwich. The Elizabeth Line doesn't go to North Greenwich, but the buses have been painted to say this connects to the Elizabeth Line because it stops at Woolwich Public Market, which it always did. It's nothing new. It always went past there. So how's that working out with the 180? Any chance we can get it going back to Lewisham? I don't know is the honest answer to that. Um, it's something I can certainly look into. And again, you know, it's something we can feed back into the, our service planning team. You know, we're, we're always, you know, the, the, the important thing is that the bus network is a live network and it's that demand changes, you know, year on year and seasonally, um, as has always been the case. And, and our planning team look very frequently at opportunities to revise it, to improve it where possible, but also where there is opportunity to, to change the routing, to improve that, that service and, and the balance of service, um, we can obviously look at that. So again, I don't, I won't sort of, it sounds like I'm giving the same answer for quite a few here, but you know, it's, you know, we, we have a new person that's, that's taken over um, looking at Greenwich bus services and it's something I can take up with him in the future. Thank you so much, Rob. I just want to put one final little request in. The 53 has been cut back twice. Uh, with the 53 goes um, through many places, but it also goes through my ward of Plumstead Common. Um, and it was cut back a couple of years ago. It used to go to Horse Guards, Whitehall. It was cut back to County Hall. But obviously in the latest round of bus adaptations, um, it's now been cut back even further to Lambeth North. Can I just put in a request? Please don't cut the 53 back any more than it has been. Thank you. So we've had that feedback. Um, I'm, I'm acutely aware of that. Um, I, at the state, I don't know when the report is scheduled for the Central London Bus Consultation. Um, a, a lot of the problem we found is that can sort of it sounds like a little bit of a cop-out, but it isn't. Um, that sort of central London pocket around Elephant and Castle, Lambeth North, etc., is heavily congested at the moment, um, especially going beyond that point. And, and, and we've found that it, within a number of routes, um, it, it is inconvenient, I understand, to have to change, to pick up another service to continue on. Um, but we, we have had sort of that, that capacity and demand does drop off significantly once you get to that particular point on the 53. Um, and it's, it's sort of a decision that's been made considering the, low pa the lower patronage that we've had on buses overall across the bus network. And um, sort of without sort of, I, I have no idea where the decision is on the 53 at the moment. And I can, as I say, it's that objection from Greenwich um, has obviously been noted by the team. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Councillor Hallam. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Rob, for coming in um, on your own as well. Um, and Abandoned me. <laughs> um, and for providing the written responses. I just have three questions on just to get more clarity on the answers that sure. you've provided. So on question six, um, we kind of talk about one of, the, one of the most dangerous junctions in my ward, East Greenwich, around Vanbrugh Hill. Um, okay. And we ask what you're planning to do about it. But you don't really kind of address uh, the changes that you're going to make at that junction in terms of traffic and the cars that are coming mm. down it. I mean, it's, it's getting to a, a point where it's quite dangerous. There's backed up traffic. Pedestrians are very upset. Mm -hmm. um, Residents that live on that road are, are very upset, and it's, it's becoming a, a huge local issue, actually. Sure. Um, I, I'm not familiar particular, with the particulars of that, that project, so I mean, I'd be happy to sort of get some more information and, and direction on sort of what's, what the next steps are and timelines and things like that, um, and, and, and sort of wider briefing for you if that helps. Yeah, that would be great. So would that come as a follow-up to this session? Yes, yeah, certainly. Or, yeah. yeah, okay, so that's question six. Thank you. I was just going to say, Councillor Hannan, that we're going to make sure that um, all the questions uh, that Rob has said he'll follow up with will get to him in the next few yeah. days. Thank you. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then just on question eight, um, we ask about the, the bus stop C and MQ on Blackwall Lane, and that's really the bus that connects East Greenwich to North Greenwich Station. Mm -hmm. yep. And we get a lot of queues, especially at peak time, mm -hmm. to go into the station. So it's just basically commuter traffic Indeed. people going in. It's one of the, the, the most direct routes to, to North Greenwich. Um, and there are just queues and, you know, you can have, wait for buses, two, sure. three buses before it goes through. Your response says it's about the unreliability of the service. Yep. We know for a fact yes. it's just about population increase and people not being able to get on the buses because the bus service hasn't increased with the population increase. No. And, you know, if you've ever waited on that bus stop, you can just see mm. the sheer numbers of people coming on to wait and not being able to get on bus after bus. And they're not really necessarily very mm. frequent buses. So is there any, we've asked this before, that that route is absolutely essential for commuter, for people working, for their livelihoods. And is there anything you can do to rethink um, the frequency of those buses? So I think there's two parts to this one. If I, I'm hoping I'm answering the right question here. <laughs> um, one is, is, a, is sort of obviously around general congestion in that particular area. Um, I know that sort of we, we're obviously been looking at bus priority um, there. Uh, one of the challenges we have is sort of adding extra buses to, to a service where the road network itself is already heavily congested doesn't necessarily improve the reliability of the service. All we end up doing is putting extra buses in long traffic jams, um, which isn't going to improve anything. It gives everybody a seat, I suppose, but it doesn't actually provide a more reliable commute for anybody. So one of the things we want to look at is obviously opportunities around bus priority uh, and where we can improve the, the, the overall reliability through sort of a, a more sort of mobile service than just increasing the capacity. If that's one of the solutions that we come up with as part of this package of measures, we can certainly look at that. But it's, it, I don't think it's a simple answer of just putting extra buses on that particular stretch of, tra of road. Okay. So you'll follow up with a... Uh... I'll certainly follow up. I know that it's uh, one of the things we are looking at is bus priority for that particular lane and... Um, I think it's a, a, a program that's in, in, in the pipeline for future. Okay. I mean, there is a stretch of, there is a bus lane, and that's operational for, mm. for most of that. Yeah, I think the timings, however, need to be re reviewed, which yeah, is one I of think the challenge that's issues. A different stretch, yeah, and it is being, I think it is being lengthened, that stretch, to yeah. ease it. Um, but that's a different stretch. Okay, but we'll get... We'll certainly get follow up on it. All right, that's great. Um, and then just question nine, which is um, about the pedestrian access to North Greenwich Station under the flyover um, near the Blackwood Tunnel south, south Approach. So that, that's quite... 
a dangerous kind of route. Actually, basically, there's no pedestrian access, and it's really dangerous trying to cross that route, and it's the only way to walk from East Greenwich to North Greenwich Station, and it just means people don't cycle the to North Greenwich Station, even though it's actually a short distance from East Greenwich, they don't walk. It would be a 20-minute walk if that route was actually safe to walk along, even less to cycle. So um, that, you know, we've been asking for a while to, for you to consider having improving pedestrian access just under that flyover, and that would really ease a lot of the, the movement into North Greenwich. Um, I don't think it's a very expensive thing to do when you, when you think about you know, investing in buses and, and other things, that, that would be the alternative. So, um, yeah, any thoughts on that? I, I could certainly pass that back to our sponsor who, who looks at opportunities um, in the borough to, to look at sort of crossings and things like that. And if it's something that's been previously flagged, um, we can certainly see if we can put that on the agenda. I can't give you a timeline on that, however, unfortunately. A lot of the funding package for certainly... Um, attributed to the recent funding deal um, has essentially been allocated. So this isn't something, unfortunately, that's going to be dealt with probably in this, certainly not in this financial year and possibly not in the next. Okay. Well. Sorry. <laughs> I, it's, unfortunately, we're, we're, as you'll appreciate, we're cutting our cloth against sort of what we're being, you know, attributed by, by the government at the moment. Um, and the, the, the reality is uh, across TfL services, patronage is down and our income has been significantly impacted by COVID and, and other factors. Um, but uh, that, that is returning. Our revenues are starting to return. Um, but as far as money being put in for, for major projects and even those small projects, it's it's a question of sort of sort of getting that funding attributed there are sort of you'll appreciate 33 boroughs that we have to, to split that pot across um, and it's you know as I say I'll, I'll, I'll ask if it's in in the, in the wish to give it sooner but uh, I can't promise I mean I think you know something like a change like this which is not very expensive mm. actually encourages people to do to, for active travel you know, supports climate change agenda is a, is, is a win-win. And even if, okay, not ideal that you can't consider it within the next year or two years, but it would be great in your response if you could say when you might have the budget to do it and to commit to doing Certainly. it by a certain date at the latest because we have been raising it for years and it's mm. a simple change that meets all of these criteria that we're all working towards. Indeed. Let me take that again. I apologise for saying I'll take it away. I'll certainly take it away. Talk to the sponsor um, who's, who's, who's responsible for putting the, um, putting the case forward for those particular things. And we can obviously talk with your borough officers around getting that onto the agenda. Uh, and if possible, we would do it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks. Um, who, oh, sorry. Thank you. Ready to go? Uh, so I also had a question about bus links, and obviously that's been asked by a few people, um, but particularly to the Elizabeth line. Uh, so you've already answered that, so I won't ask again. But, I mean, it'd be helpful to see some data ourselves about uh, the kind of uses of bus, buses. I don't know if that's something we normally get as, as councillors kind of periodically. I'm a new councillor, so that's my excuse for not knowing if we already get it. But it would be helpful, even when we're communicating to, to constituents about why, you know, the, the buses aren't being invested in, you know, it's the numbers aren't there. So if there's any way we could get some of that data, that would be helpful. Yeah, there, I think there is some performance data available on the TfL network. I'll see if I can dig out where that is. I don't know how granular that goes down to, um, but it will certainly give you an, a, a sense of some of the things. Um, but obviously, if there are case-by-case -case specifics, we can, I can talk to our, our planning team um, and get an understanding from them as to sort of, you know, why decisions are made. And, and indeed, moving forward, if there are sort of requests um, for, you know, changes to services, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we're happy to consider those. You know, as I said before, it's a, a live bus network um, and the demand changes um, seasonally, it seems. Um, you know, and, and as a result, we need to respond to that. So you know, if there are opportunities to change it and change it to the benefit of, the cu of customers across the line, then we can obviously consider those. 
Okay, great, thanks. Uh, and my other question um, was about the Elizabeth Line, um, but actually about the Elizabeth Line uh, in Clary Wharf, because I, I, I use the Elizabeth Line, lots of residents do, um, and the, we, we heard from the earlier discussion how the walking from one station to another can really impact whether people use it. Mm. And that particular walk from um, the Elizabeth Line to Jubilee Line, for example, going through the uh, shopping centre isn't particularly accessible uh, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people are going on the other trains because of that. Is that in the plan to do a more connected route? I don't know is okay. the honest answer to that. That would be helpful. Uh, I, it's something I can certainly raise with, with them. I don't, I don't think there is because we're uh, it's certainly in Canary Wharf, we're, we're constrained by the fact that the, the, whole, the wider estate is owned by Canary Wharf management. Um, so there's very little additional stuff we can do around the actual estate itself. I'm sure they appreciate us walking past all the shops. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, do you, any uh, members of the public, other councillors have questions? Um, can you come forward and use this microphone, all right? So don't, we don't have the roving mic anymore. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. And I appreciate this is, you may be not be able to answer all these, so I'll just um, give them and you can take them away. Um, three of them are on Silvertown. Um, so I, I, would it be possible if TfL can give me an example of a new road project, told or not, anywhere in the world that has resulted in less traffic and improved air quality? That's my one, first question. Um, the second question is about this PM 2.5 because the monitoring for Silvertown Tunnel is out of date. It's not, if it's not looking at PM 2.5, it's out of date. So when is TfL going to start monitoring PM 2.5 with the Silvertown Tunnel? Um, and the third question for Silvertown is that those tunnel, the, the roads are coming out in between a load of schools. Um, so what plans does TfL have in terms of mitigation measures around that air quality um, to protect those schools? if they're not measuring PM 2.5. Um, so those are three. And then the other one is sort of leads on from what Councillor Hannan was saying about the, the intense um, traffic in the, on the A206. And TFL, um, in, in the C4 consultation, it raised the Angostine roundabout and how a way of relieving traffic, traffic of, the, of the A206 would be to cut the A102 access so to block that access, which is a great idea. I think it would be a fantastic idea. Um, so is it possible for TfL to come back with, if they're thinking of implementing it, um, would they be bringing it forward? Kind of where they are with that idea of, of doing that, that would be great. I, I'm, I'm going to upset you a little bit here. I'm going to say I'm going to have to take the wall away, um, if you don't mind. I, I literally, Silvertown, my limited knowledge is probably been expired. <laughs> Um, on that, and the other, other question, I'll certainly take back to the project sponsor that looks after the C CS4 program. Um, there were two questions over there. Uh, would you like to come forward first? There we go. Right. Great. Um, actually, I've got a number of questions, but firstly, I'd like to say that we feel the same about the Angostine right roundabout. Uh, sorry, I'm Westcombe Society. My name's Emily Norton, and I'm from the Westcombe Society, and we cover the area just south of the railway, so south, uh, but east of Greenwich Park. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, we've long been concerned about pedestrian access across the Angostine roundabout. Um, and also my other questions are about buses. I mean, I've recently filled in the transport strategy thing um, for Greenwich. And one of the things that we're concerned about in our area, it, TfL and you as a borough want to reduce car usage. Our area is on a very steep hill. The transport strategy just talks about Shooters Hill being a steep hill. I think this affects the whole of the north side of Greenwich. And in our area particularly, which I admit is, it's mixed, but it, 
some people, you know, it, it's also quite affluent, but then so are some other areas. Um, we live on a steep hill. At the bottom of the hill are all the facilities, the tube, the um, railway line, and the shops, in particular Charlton Riverside, which is where all the big supermarkets are, etc. Since Sainsbury's moved, our area has not had a bus route to the supermarket. We have multiple bus routes down Westcombe Hill, so many that the residents are now up in arms about there being so many bus routes down Westcombe Hill. And every time there's a new bus service that goes that route, and I'm wondering about these proposals for the for town tunnel, they go down Westcombe Hill. Some of us, people who live within reach of Westcombe Hill, they can get to North Greenwich easily, but they still can't get to the supermarkets. So people use their cars. It's five to 10 minutes to get to North Greenwich or the supermarkets in your car. Who's not going to use it if you've got a car and you've got to get two buses? For where my side of Westcombe Park, which is the western side of Westcombe Park, you have to get three buses if you don't want to carry stuff up and down the hill. Most people cannot carry, well, I mean a lot of people, it's not just the disabled, cannot carry luggage, push push chairs, ride bikes, carrying shopping up and down, up that hill. And the thing is that it's uphill when you're coming back from the shops. So people use their cars. Now, my question to TfL, or something I want you to put on the list, I recognize that there are financial constraints, but is again another, like this lady over here said about buses, is that you re if you want to get people out of cars, you really need to be looking at where to put bus routes that will persuade people to get out of their cars. And that doesn't let mean in an area like us, yes, it's, it, if, the, if it was flat, I would cycle to Sainsbury's. If it was flat, I would wheel my luggage when I come back from holiday to up from the station or up from the bus. It's not, it's not possible. So you, you ask somebody to come and pick you up in a car. And I think that you need to be thinking not necessarily about new bus routes, but when you're thinking about rerouting bus routes, distributing them more so that or, or doing something like on the peninsula, a bus route that when it comes back from North Greenwich goes past all the supermarkets and picks up, because people can walk down to the supermarket, but it picks up the people with their shopping coming back and it comes up to the whole area. It's ridiculous to live five minutes drive from somewhere that you can't get to on, on the bus or you can't get back from on the bus. And, and I just want to put that in front of this these councillors, but also on the TfL list. I recognise it's not something that's going to be solved in the short time, but if you're all really serious about getting people out of their cars, you need to think about bus routes being better spread so that they really serve where people need to go and the local journeys, not just the long, journey, long distance journeys. So that was the first point I wanted to make, and that was the biggest point. Another thing about bus lanes, though, is that some of our members are very concerned about, is the loss of the bus lane on Trafalgar Road, Woolwich Road, which has slowed down buses significantly. Now, we recognize the fact that it's for a cycle lane. A lot of people complain that the cycle lane's never used. Well, I'm a cyclist, and I know that that's the whatever, whichever number it is that goes along that way, number four, I think. I know it isn't yet complete into town. And until it's complete, it may not be fully used. But the fact is that putting in that cycle lane has taken away a bus lane. How are TfL going to solve that problem? And also what monitoring has been put in place to look at the impact of that happening and was it the right decision um, I have I'm pleased to have heard there are lots of questions about Silvertown one thing you said that the southbound is shortly going down to two lanes permanently does that mean that it's two lanes all the way up to where it feeds into the Sun in Sa under the Sun in Sands roundabout 
so we'll start, start with the first, first question there. So it's been quite a long time since we last did a, a, a holistic look at the bus network in Greenwich. I think it's some years, four, five, six, more than that. Um, one of our aspirations, um, and I, I, I can't give you a commitment on time, and is to look holistically at the bus network in Greenwich. Um, and, and this is an opportunity, not necessarily for, for new buses, but as you as you said, you know, looking at where we can repurpose and adjust some of the routes that better serve the community. Um, and I think that's a prime example of perhaps one where we could probably look at you know, modifying an existing route to to just pick up a, a better better feed as it comes down that hill. So it's certainly one one to look at for the future. Um, it is, as I say, an aspiration to, to look at the Greenwich bus network, um, and, but it, it's not, I, I can't tell you exactly when that, will, when that will be properly looked at, but it'd be one that we'd certainly, you know, that is another example of, of one where we can look at not necessarily, in, as I say, introducing new buses, but repurposing and better purposing our existing fleets. Hmm. Um, now I've got to use my memory. Oh, it was, <laughs> um, just to follow on the buses, I mean, part of the problem in our area is, and I suspect in other areas where the hill is, is that the roads tend to go north-south, mm. which means actually walking to Westcombe Hill to get the yeah. bus means going down the hill or walking back up it after you've got off the bus. So you actually need the buses in different areas or going along the top, the main road at the top so that people can get mm. you know it, it they shouldn't all be in one place no, is what I'm trying I, to say. I, I agree with you yeah. and, and, and you know ultimately the bus network is there to you know, get people around efficiently and connect into those key um, services and shopping and things like that and, and obviously if it's not in your case then it's certainly something we can look at okay. for, my yeah. second question was the removal of the bus lane the loss of the bus lane on Trafalgar Road, Woolwich Road, and what are TfL planning to do to mitigate the fact that buses are now held up? It's, you know, we obviously work to try and make sure that we continue to keep the bus network flowing as, as efficiently as possible. Um, you know, work on, on Cycle Super Highway 4 is continuing, and there are um, further stages that are scheduled to sort of be at the end of their consultation period as we continue the next steps. Um, so I expect that will, that will form part of that report and analysis. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is introduce a new piece of infrastructure that impedes part of our other piece of infrastructure. So uh, I expect that will form part of that reporting. Okay, and the, the third question was these where you say the Silver Town Tunnel, and you may not be able to answer this, where you say the Silver Town Tunnel is going down to two lanes, mm. because whether it, where it's stopping going down to two lanes, because the problem at the moment, southbound, which mm. has already been mentioned, is that it's where the three lanes go down to two lanes. Now, if it's starting at two lanes right from the tunnel mm -hmm. and continuing like that under the sun in sands, then the traffic will have already gone down to two lanes and hopefully queued in the tunnel rather than in Greenwich. Um, but it, it, that, is that is relevant because I think what all of us have been mm. worrying about in Greenwich, and it particularly affects our area and the schools in our area, is there are queues going southbound where the three lanes go down mm. to two. And what is TfL going to do about it? Because they haven't told us ever in all the Silver Town, and that's one of the big concerns. And my just last very quick question, which I thought of after our suffering southeastern's intractability about trains, is TfL still committed to eventually taking over the metro service as part of TfL? Because I think from what we saw earlier this evening, that part of the problem is that southeastern are always having to balance up our metro services mm. with their the services to Kent and the wider areas, and it seems obvious that the metro services should be part of TfL so they can be all integrated and we can have a tube-like network inside uh, London. So I'll 
Sorry, can I ask if we can be as quick as possible because I think yeah, we actually no, want to I'll close the building. Sorry. So touching on, on, on the Silvertown and the, the Southern approach, I mean, the, the work at the moment obviously work contributes towards the realignment of the road going into the Silvertown tunnel, mm -hmm. so that will fundamentally change the makeup of that particular stretch in the short term. Um, the impact will obviously there will be an impact. I don't think there's any any way of avoiding that. I'll, I'll be as honest yeah. as I can. Um, and, and obviously, the long-term goal and aspiration will be a, a sort of a, that that general congestion will be spread a lot more evenly between the two pieces of uh, those two roads. So the the, the Blackwall Tunnel and the Silvertown Tunnel. That's ultimately the aspiration and and. Yeah, you know, I truly hope that that's how it works. It's, it's the traffic coming out of the tunnel. Indeed. Southbound in the evening that's uh, understood. the unexplained uh, issue. And then obviously sort of metro, metronization or metroization. That there was an aspiration at one point. I, I truly don't know where that is because that's been many, many years and probably be talking about this in many more years yeah. in the future. Well, I hope they keep aspiring to it. Indeed. Especially Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think there's one more question. Hello, thanks, Chair. I won't keep you. Um, I'm Daryl Chamberlain. I'm actually a journalist from 85 Feet at London, but since you're here, I thought I'd try and get a question in because um, it's the bit quickest way to find out. Um, Silvertown Tunnel Buses. Um, during the public hearings for it, the, the modelling for the Silvertown Tunnel is based on a bus work of 37 and a half buses an hour. Um, this now appears to have been cut down to 20. That bus network included five bus routes. We're now presented with three. Um, one, um, um, and a couple were just sort of um, going a little bit south of the river, so don't really concern us. But the one that's been dropped is a bus from uh, Elton to Beckton via the Silvertown Tunnel. What's happened? I'm, if, if, if you're happy with this, I'd like to sort of take that question away and come back to you with a, a personalised answer. I think it's, as I say, I'm picking this up for, for a colleague who will be more adept and, and understand it, sort of what planning has gone into sort of that bus network proposal. So it, it, I'll, I'll give you my business card if that helps and, and perhaps get, drop me a line. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Um, thank you so much uh, for staying so late. My pleasure. <laughs> um, and for taking um, for answering the questions and for taking some away. We will come back to you with, with a list of the questions. Thank We're not you. expecting to have remembered all of them. Excellent. Um, there's two more items on the agenda panel. <laughs> Let me find it. Um, so item six is the action list. There's a few items outstanding. Raymond, can you chase them and try and get responses by December's meeting. Item seven, can we agree to commission the future reports? Fabulous. Thank you very much, everybody.